The chiefs owe their allegiance to His Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, elect of God, Emperor of Ethiopia. It is also violence. When villages in Gojam, Eritrea, Arusi, and Bali are ruthlessly bombarded, women, children, men. Total support to the Liberation Army. And despite internal sabotage, the Revolutionary Army continued its offensive. Or how could it be resigned to the aggression against the motherland? A land where the people were in the process of correctly determining their future. Many people both at home and abroad were struck and shocked by its intensity, and many claimed they didn't see it coming, that it was spontaneous. This was obviously untrue. That uprising was the result of years of organizing repression and building tension. The Ethiopian revolution is regarded in much the same way, with many leftists speaking of it in 1974 the same way and being wrong for the same reason. The Ethiopian revolution was by no means a spontaneous affair but the result of nearly two decades of increasingly hostile repression and increasingly sharp anti-monarchist socialist analysis in action. Who led this action? None other than the same students whose education was bought and paid for by one Haile Selassie. In brief summary, the Ethiopian student movement beginning in 1962 and lasting through the duration of the Ethiopian revolution until about 1979 was one of the major drivers of the Ethiopian revolution and its political outcomes. Its membership can be traced directly through major figures from its inception in 1962 to all the wings of the major splits in the revolution post-1974. This video in particular traces the beginnings of the student movement in the 50s and 60s, then moves on to the revolutionary period between 1974 and 1971. This video is in companion with another previous video I've done on Ethiopian history, but you don't have to have seen it to enjoy this one. If you remember part one of this series, you probably remember that one of Haile Selassie, the Emperor of Ethiopia's primary goals once he took power back from Italian colonizers and British neo-colonizers in the early 1950s, was to continue Ethiopia's modernization and the construction of a highly centralized Ethiopian state. No small task when the maintenance of even a semi-decentralized state was barely manageable. Ethiopia at this point was still a semi-feudal nation. Most of its population were essentially serfs or sharecroppers paying rent and taxes to a landed aristocracy that made up the bureaucratic wings of Selassie's regime, as well as local rulership that worked under his regime. There was a nascent urban working class, but they were small and constituted a comparatively small wing of Ethiopia's class structures. Most of the country was poor, and barely a third of the country was literate under Selassie. The modernization process involved the violent subjugation of regional autonomy and regional rulers across Ethiopia by Haile Selassie, replacing governors and local rulers as needed, suppressing local rebellions such as the first Wayane in Tigray, and other tasks oriented at securing Haile Selassie's rule, establishing Amharic as the primary language in Ethiopia, and putting down potential rivals in other parts of Ethiopia among them. This was the central task of his regime before the Italian invasion in 1936, and one of his continued struggles as he worked to centralize Ethiopia beyond previous iterations. The other important aspect of this process was creating the Addis Ababa University in 1950. It was already the tradition in Ethiopia for certain young people to be raised on an education in statecraft so they could one day take the reins of the country, and the university was a continuation of this tradition. In fact, one of the major fights that the student movement took up was the expansion of education access to the wider population of Ethiopia, rather than just the privileged few who came from wealthy families or families with a history in politics. It was this expansion that made the student movement possible, bringing together college students, university administration, high school teachers, and overwhelmingly high school students. These were the people who built the movement that toppled an increasingly fascistic and paranoid Selassie. 
Of all the threats to his rule, the Eritrean Uprising, the Niwe coup, and various other players, it was shocking to say the least to have the very students whose education he fostered use that education to try and correct his wrongs. The students were uniquely situated among the political environment of Ethiopia at the time, still a nascent capitalist power slouching forth from the womb of feudalism. Ethiopia had no political parties, no real labor organization outside of the state-controlled CELU, which worked closely with the AFL-CIO, and Selassie's regime to hinder more radical labor activity, and too small of an industrial working class for the kind of labor organizing that other countries had at the time. Ethiopian universities, however, became the primary mode of mass political participation, which makes sense. Ethiopian universities specifically existed to educate and prepare her upper class's offspring for rulership in the many cities and provinces under the regime. Raised to view access to politics as essentially an inheritance, the first waves of the student movement had a clear intent to use their university as a basis for political organizing, and one of their first goals was the expansion of education to working class and peasant class Ethiopians. These conditions left the Ethiopian students' movement uniquely situated among the revolutionary upturns globally in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. As Ian Scott Horst, author of one of my sources for this video, points out, no other student movement in the world at the time was nearly as successful in actually bringing about a revolution. The interplay between the students and the emperor's regime often plays like a cycle of abuse between a parental figure and a child, with Selassie's imperial guard and the military acting as the belt, often to the tune of hospitalizations, violent arrests, and martyred students, all capped off with the emperor's cold and chastising words to a student population, increasingly unafraid of his retaliation and hungry for their own. The death of activist and student organizer Tilahun Jaza at the hands of Ethiopian cops, as a result of this escalation, further radicalized the students. He and a number of subsequent martyrs became fuel on the fire that was revolutionary Ethiopia. I was lucky enough to find a really good history of the student movement, the book The Quest for Socialist Utopia by Baru Zoidi, as well as the book Like Ho Chi Minh, Like Che Guevara by Ian Scott Horst, and the book Ethiopia in Theory, Revolution and Knowledge Production by Eleni Zaleki. I definitely recommend this book as a read, especially if you're a student yourself and want to organize. But despite its successes, the story of the student movement ends, as many others do, in quite bitter tragedy and division as splits between the students who deposed the emperor and the military dictatorship that rose after known as the dirge led to terror campaigns, repression, and continued war. Someone commented under the previous video that they liked it, but that I had basically only covered the less controversial parts of Ethiopian history. Here is where we start to get to that. I will say I'm not Ethiopian, and though I've taken a lot of time to research these topics, far be it from me to claim that my conclusions will be perfect or rock solid. I want to be as neutral as possible with the information when it comes to these topics, at least in terms of being that fully honest about what takes place. We left off just after the Niwe brothers' coup in 1960, where Jermame Niwe and Mengitsu Niwe, a high-ranking figure in Selassie's Imperial Guard, attempted a populist and socialistic coup, which was put down by the army with the help of the U.S. military. During that coup, the students had come out in mass public demonstration in a way that had really never been seen before but were quickly forced back down by the army and the police, whom they had never been in a serious encounter with before this point. On top of that, the Ethiopian state in 1962 was embroiled in a conflict of a colonial nature with Eritrea, which was fighting to establish an independent state free from Selassie's regime. Both of these events were major in the development of the student movement, but before we go there, allow me to give more background on the students themselves. So without further ado, we're going to look at the Ethiopian student movement and revolutionary Ethiopia, and the aftermath of both. Let me tell you a story. It was March 3rd, 1951 when the UCAA was officially inaugurated. It was the first institution of higher learning in Ethiopia ever. Before that, there had been secondary schools established, but no institutions higher than that had existed. The new college was part of Haile Selassie's push to modernize Ethiopia into a liberal capitalist empire. Despite this intention, there were no STEM classes held there until 1957, and before that point it was primarily a liberal arts academy. Within the decade, though, Ethiopia had other schools the Engineering and Building College, an Agricultural College in Harar, and a Public Health College in Gondar. 
1961, a team of professors from the University of Utah were hired by the emperor to fold all of these schools, including the UCAA, into one Haile Selassie Imperial University. This new school was inaugurated in December of 1961, with the emperor donating one of his palaces to serve as the main campus, which he probably did since a bunch of people got murdered there during the Niwe coup about a year before. There was a large event put on and attended by over 1,300 people and students where the emperor was lauded and thanked for the great leap forward in Ethiopia's struggle to enlighten its children. But the more interesting development of the night is a speech given by Mumu Bizabe, the president of NUES, the National Union of Ethiopian Students, which he had snuck up his sleeve. In it, he criticized Ethiopia for being backwards compared to other African nations. It was a small hiccup, but a sign of legitimately existing displeasure with the pace and direction of Ethiopia's modernization and with Selassie's rule. The students had other griefs as well. A harbinger of what was to come later, students early on complained of the amount of American influences on their system and campus culture that they experienced. To put things into perspective, Selassie's control over Ethiopia was only partially secured during this time period, with the British having returned control post-liberation and Eritrea existing as a federation of Ethiopia, Selassie was both more powerful than he had ever been and more vulnerable than he had ever been. Ethiopians were and still are no strangers to internal conflict. Besides the Niwe coup in 1960 and the beginnings of the Eritrean War for Independence in 1961, Selassie was dealing with other hiccups and challenges to his rule. In 1951, Mengetsu Niwe actually helped foil a plot against the emperor by Gojam resistance leader Nagash Bezabi. Haile Selassie's role as emperor was shaky and he was well aware of it, as well as of the threat the students potentially posed to his rule. Regardless, he took the gamble. The early grumblings of students were inconsequential, but not unnoticed. At this point in time, the students didn't have any sort of collective voice or organization. The closest they had was the student council, whose main roles were administering extracurricular activities and aiding the faculty in keeping the students in line. The general vibe that the students were getting from the faculty above them was that of distrust, and faculty were told pretty explicitly that they were to control the students, teach them discipline, and keep them from causing trouble. The council became the University College Union in the 1961-1962 school year. Dissatisfied with these conditions, some students searched for alternative modes of establishing a collective voice. The idea of bringing together different college unions and associations under one national organization also first emerged in the late 1950s. On his return from an international gathering in Peru in early 1959, Hagos Gebreyesus, president of UCU, started exploring ways of setting up an Ethiopian student union. This was followed by a meeting on June 4th of the presidents of the five college unions. The result was the setting up, in the following year, of the National Union of Ethiopian Students, NUES, with Mulugeta Bezabe of Alamaya as the first president, and Tadisi Tamrat, Shibru Sefu, and Balu Germa, all of UCAA, as vice president, secretary general, and treasurer respectively. The NUES was forced to change its name to the National Union of Ethiopian University Students in 1963. Baruzwadi explains that parallel to the development of the student unions came student publications. Throughout the Ethiopian student movement and beyond into the actual revolution itself, zine culture on and off campus was essential. Student publications from papers like Challenge, and later on publications from party structures such as the EPRP's Democracia and Maison's Voice of the Masses and others guided the revolutionary struggle and acted as a stage for intermovement conflict, synthesis, and debate. Early student publications in the 50s were explicitly discouraged from engaging in politics or religion. Students criticized early papers for lacking substance, and the existing restrictions Haile Selassie's regime had made the students reluctant to actually contribute to student papers. It was in October of 1959 when the most famous student publication, News and Views, was published. This was actually the usual UCAA newsletter with a formalized name change, though it continued to struggle and in its writings lamented the lack of student contributions. One of the solutions to this issue was found in the That'll Be the Day column of the student paper. Here, students found an outlet to express the nuances and contradictions of campus life anonymously, including the nature of anonymous contributions themselves. In this, as in so many other student contributions, anonymity was to be a distinctive feature of student publications, with the adoption of pen names such as The Student, The Other Student, The Inquirer, etc. The penchant for anonymity did not go unchallenged, interestingly enough, including in the That Will Be The Day column itself. An issue of April 1963 carried the following. 
that will be the day when students are brave enough to let their names appear in News and Views under their contributions. There was a clear and consistent current of at least mild student radicalism in the early days of the university's existence, and in the early student-faculty dynamics and publications as well as the extremely lively and intense debate programs that existed on UCAA campuses, where students debated everything from feminism to freedom of speech. But it wasn't until 1961 that these tensions would begin to see fruit with the College Day fiasco. College Day was an annual sort of field day put on at the end of each academic year that featured both athletic events and poetry competitions. These events were a big deal and the emperor himself attended and handed out prizes to winners. The tradition started in 1959, but it was a poem read in 1961 that caused massive controversy. Eating Hafenjara of the poorest quality, washing it down with a tumbler of water, strewing grass on my earthen bed, I lied down with tattered cloth for my blanket and praise God as if this was a life worth living. Tamiru Faisa. This poem was insanely popular among the students and the public, and Tamiru won that day. The emperor, however, was beyond unhappy. But the emperor was far from amused from what he had heard. The unpleasant evocation of poverty by the winning poet came to be regarded as a breach of imperial protocol with fateful consequences for the next college day and beyond. In short, the officers of the Union were summoned to the palace and asked to submit poems to be recited for prior scrutiny by the palace if they wished his imperial majesty to grace the day with his presence. They would not be given another chance to invite him and heap abuses on him, as was to be expected. The Union was not prepared to subject its activities to such censorship. The emperor failed to attend the college day for the first time since the tradition was initiated. As it turned out, the fears of the palace were not entirely groundless, for the three poems recited on the 1962 College Day proved to be even more daring in their portrayal of the Ethiopian social and political reality. The government's reaction to this continuing defiance was swift. Within a month of the observance of the College Day, it announced the abolition of the boarding system. The official reason given to this drastic step was that the measure was taken in order to use the funds thus saved to enroll more students. That was also what the emperor claimed when a delegation of students went to the palace and presented a petition asking him to reverse the decision. He rebuked them for their self-centeredness in the following rhetorical manner. How dare you oppose our effort to provide education to all? Don't you know that we care not only for you, but also for your parents? How can you in all conscience oppose the increase in the number of students in Ethiopia? But it is difficult to accept such explanation at face value. What makes them suspect is that the measure was accompanied by the suspension of the members of the executive committee of the student union and three winning poets and the imposition of fines on staff members who had served as judges. Thus is established an antagonistic relationship between the students and the state that will only escalate from this point forward. But despite the growing and increasingly troublesome radicalism among the students, there were internal tensions also already brewing. For one, Putting aside the more ideological splits between, say, the business school students who made a point of being more obedient and less troublesome, and other more radical student groups, there was also the question of women on campus and whether they even belonged there, as well as how they deserved to be treated. The women of the movement were no strangers to male chauvinism, and particularly vicious harassment of student women on campus was quite common. Female students even entering the campus would often face crowds of jeering male students, especially early in the student movement and the lively debate culture mentioned earlier was more than happy to openly question whether it was beneficial to society for women to be educated. That's a real quote. Throughout the entire history of the student movement, while women made up some of the most important key figures and martyrs of the revolution, there were almost no executive female leaders throughout the entire movement. Baruzawedi provides a poem written by an anonymous female student calling herself Sabian. If you smile at him, he thinks you're flirty. If you don't, he thinks you're an iceberg. If you let him kiss you, he wishes you were more reserved. If you don't, he seeks consolation elsewhere. If you flatter him, he thinks you're simple. If you don't, he thinks you don't understand. If you go around with other fellows, he thinks you're fickle. If you don't, he thinks no one else will have you. Men, God bless them. You can't get along with them. But what would the basketball team do without them? There was a conscious effort among students to specifically organize the women on campus. Male students such as Tilihun Chaza and Johannes Berhane both made active efforts to gain the political interest of women on campus. But it wasn't until 1971 that the first women's study groups were established by diaspora students, and eventually these study groups coalesced into the WWEWSG, Worldwide Ethiopian Women's Study Groups. This study group was headed by Ababek Bekili, 
who had been inspired after studying with the Black Panthers to work toward organizing spaces for women within the student movement. Much of the progress made organizing the women was done in spite of the men rather than with their help, at least early on in the movement. In later stages, women would play more significant roles in organizing at all levels. Bikili herself would go on to head the WWFES in 1973. Early notions of what we understand now as intersectionality are present as the woman question, as Wadey refers to it, is answered by Ethiopian radical women. This organizing group maintained its own female-oriented student publication. This was founded in 1972 and acted as a place to study the theoretical and historical position of women in society through the stages of social evolution. Another brewing conflict was one over the national question. When Eritrea's war for independence began in 1961, it sent shockwaves through the student movement, much like the Niwe coup did in 1960. The Eritrean war for independence from the Ethiopian state both pioneered and established the possibility of armed national struggle for liberation within Ethiopia, but forced students to take a stand on the situation. Eventually, the conflict over the national question would escalate into a split, but in the meantime, the question served as another point of radicalization for students. Eritrean students were on campus both at home and in the diaspora, so the war was felt deeply by both Eritrean and non-Eritrean students. It also sparked a conversation about how the Ethiopian state had even constituted itself to begin with. Baru Zawedi traces the development of the Ethiopian state through history starting with the Battle of Adwa that cemented Emperor Menelik's rule over Ethiopia after driving out the Italian colonizers. At this point, Menelik's primacy was secured, but his rule was still somewhat decentralized. Ethiopia's size and terrain having made greater control in that time period basically impossible. It wasn't until Haile Selassie's rule and the emergence of some form of modernity that it became more reasonable to seek higher levels of centralization. But it is important to note here that it was Menelik's consolidation of power that set the internally colonial relations between various Ethiopian nations that would later come to be a dominant issue. The two most important vehicles of this were obviously the military and the school system. The military crushed local peasant uprisings over land and taxes, as well as upstart local rulers and nascent ethnic and nationalist uprisings, while the school system's primary job was working toward the absolute assimilation of people such as the Oromo, Afar, and others. This was achieved through the establishment of Amharic as Ethiopia's national language in 1963 and the propagation of Ethiopian nationalism throughout. The Ethiopian student movement lagged behind on this issue, and the confrontations between Eritrean students and Ethiopian students happened semi-frequently through the mid to late 60s. It wasn't until the late 60s and early 70s that these tensions would fully solidify into splits and open conflict, however. Until that point, though, the students who weren't Eritrean tended toward Ethiopian nationalism, and the Ethiopian state worked hard to propagate that, stoking anti-Arab sentiments and working to associate Eritreans with rival Arab states to distance them from Ethiopians, especially other ethnic minorities in Ethiopia, such as the Oromo, who might find common cause in the struggle for national independence. Eritreans were widely resented for essentially refusing to fold quietly into the ongoing centralization process and refusing to be literally colonized by Ethiopia. They were accused of narrow nationalism, undermining Ethiopian unity, and being puppets of Arab states. These sentiments were worsened by ELF plane hijackings. This is starting to feel eerily familiar. Radical students lamented the Eritrean uprising for failing to acknowledge the primacy of class struggle, although there were populist left forces within the Eritrean revolution alongside others. We will become more familiar with these tensions as they explode later on, but for now just be aware that they are present throughout the 60s and build progressively as the Eritrean struggle escalates. The actual process of radicalization for the students is a somewhat long one. One significant factor was the foreign influence in Ethiopia from students across Africa who came to study there. Ethiopian students exposed to students from other developing African nations recently liberated from colonialism came to feel that their own nation was lagging behind. 
This, among other foreign influences from America and other Western countries, helped to build the sentiments that would metastasize into the student movement and the revolution. The ongoing civil rights movement and the unfolding struggle in Vietnam throughout the mid-60s to mid-70s also served to provide both tactics and ideas to the student movement, and in the case of specifically Vietnam, a model revolution to shoot for. The desire to emulate the Vietnamese and Cuban struggles was pervasive throughout the movement in its middle and later stages. Experiences in America among Ethiopian students abroad aided in the process of radicalization. The harsh treatment of black Americans was a massive culture shock to them, and they found safety and solidarity abroad among black Americans in the civil rights and black power movements, as well as theoretical inspiration in figures like Frantz Fanon. One of the first times that Ethiopian students would take to the streets in protest would be the abortive Niwe coup, led by the brothers Mengitsu and Germane Niwe. To give a brief rundown, in 1960, Germane Niwe, a politician who had in the past been suspended from his governor position in Wolamo due to policies he put in place to alleviate poverty within those regions, and his brother Mengetsu Niwe, an Ethiopian Imperial Guard commander, organized a coup attempt to end the oppression of Ethiopia's poor masses by the emperor and the feudal government he defended. Before resorting to a coup, Jamame tried to use his position to enact policies that would help the poor, giving away government-owned land and reducing the amount of free labor required of Ethiopian peasantry. This got him removed from office in Wolamo and placed in Jijiga. He did basically the exact same thing there, as well as going after ineffective political leadership there, and this time faced direct intervention from Addis Ababa. He concluded that only violence could free Ethiopia's people, and convinced his brother Mengitsu to help him. Unfortunately, this coup wasn't well planned and ended poorly, with a lot of dead politicians and even dead Ur and Niwe siblings. But what's interesting is that the students during this coup actually came out in support, and were run off by the police. This confrontation with the students was really Haile Selassie's first confrontation with them, and it set the tone for the rest of their relationship, and it was the source of constant mild acrimony between the government and the students. For the emperor, it reminded him that these students were another potential contender for power in the state he was trying to build, and could become a problematic element for his position as a living god of Ethiopia. The students also found the experience eye-opening and profound, even if they were forced to recant support for the coup and apologize to the emperor for supporting it. Despite a rough entrance onto the Ethiopian stage via the abortive coup, student protests would slowly come to be a very common occurrence, post the college day fiasco, and as the radical student culture grew. The mid-1960s onward saw the most student action. One of the most important steps to this process of growing action was the establishment of the University Service Program. Second, the movement benefited from the Ethiopian University Service EUS program. Introduced in 1964, this program made it mandatory for Ethiopian students to work one year in the provinces, generally after the junior year of studies. EUS participants who numbered 132 in 1964, 262 in 1966 and 67, and 590 in 71 and 72, mainly served as teachers. For example, in 1966 to 67, 189 or 72.1% of the participants taught in schools. These teachers, who also participated in numerous extracurricular activities, brought to the outlying schools first-hand information of the Ethiopian student movement, which was virtually restricted to the Addis Ababa campuses during its early existence. Not only was the movement thus extended to the provinces and the lower levels of the educational system, but also freshmen came to the university relatively well prepared to participate in the movement upon arrival. Many EUS participants and ex-participants contributed articles to the university student papers about their experiences in the rural areas and smaller towns where the feudal status quo was most visible. This program essentially allowed the radicalism of the older students to be handed down to the high school students. High school students would be taught by radical college students in this program, and then as they grew older and went to college themselves, essentially created a pipeline from the high schools to the college student unions. As the movement went on, these high school students would become one of the most essential organizing blocks for staging radical actions, and would engage in some of the hardest forms of struggle during the darker moments of the revolution. Another step in this process was the establishment of student publications as mentioned before. Student publications such as News and Views and Challenge were the battlegrounds where student movements' political lines were drawn, and the works published there weighed significantly on Ethiopian politics. It was these publications that would provide some of the earliest critiques of Ethiopia's systems and where the analysis of Ethiopia as a feudal society would originate. Another step, just as, if not more important, was the establishment of the Crocodile Society. 
This was a radical core of Marxist student organizers who anonymously analyzed and critiqued Ethiopian society and politics and pushed forward radical ideas in a country where dissent was not welcome. And they did so effectively. Speaking through official and unofficial student publications via pseudonyms, they effectively propagandized to their peers. And a direct line can be drawn on paper between when they were founded and when student agitation starts to become a more regular and more significant occurrence. What little is known of their membership includes Ziru Kishan, who would later become a senior member of the EPRP, Gebru Gebruwold, Hailu Gebru Johannes, Johannes Sabatu, Abera Wakjira, Taye Germu, and Seyum Welde Johannes. The students staged many demonstrations through the build-up to the 1974 overthrow of Haile Selassie, including for the expansion of access to education to impoverished Ethiopians in 1969. But one of their first and most memorable demonstrations was the Land to the Tiller protest. and this to provide some background, as mentioned in the previous video, Ethiopia at this point was still a semi-feudal society. Capitalism was nascent there. While there was an urban proletariat, it was small, and there was little manufacturing done in Ethiopia at this time. Most people were peasants, essentially serfs under a land tenure system of the time. In 1942, Haile Selassie had declared a new land tax system that would set rates based on the fertility of the land, ranked as fertile, semi-fertile, or poor, dividing them into gashas, 40 hectares of land. If you've seen the last video on this subject, then you might remember some of this being covered right now. The landlords and nobles, as well as peasant populations in Gojam, Tigray, and Begemdir, however, protested this taxation heavily, despite a massively violent crackdown that included the bombing of villages by the Air Force, continued resistance from local peasants and landed peoples, forced Selassie to fold. He gave in to demands, excluding those provinces from taxes, which then led to others being exempted, and a 10% flat tax on all land except for that of the church. As mentioned in the previous video, these taxes were passed on to the tenants who worked that land because the only thing Haile Selassie's regime could actually agree on was fuck the poor. Unfortunately, this trend continued into the 60s. In the southern provinces of Ethiopia, over 75% of people were tenants. As a result of internal conquest of the southern regions in the late 1800s and early 1900s under Menelik, many more people in these regions were tenants and didn't own land and much of it had been given out as rewards to loyal local rulers who aided in the conquests, the church and the state. Haile Selassie had also awarded some of these lands to anti-fascist patriots post-World War II. The impoverished state of many tenants 
meant that they couldn't afford the supplies and equipment needed to improve their production, despite pressure from the government and landlords to make that happen. For many students who came from the countryside and personally witnessed these cycles of poverty, poor harvests, and poor land management and use, this was a central issue, so it was no surprise that students began to organize around it. The trigger for the event was a bill brought before the Ethiopian parliament in January of 1963. It went through a few changes and was approved by the Chamber of Deputies in 1964. Then it was presented to the Senate, who promptly rejected it 74 to 14. The reforms within the bill were minimal, a mild reduction in the maximum rent from 75 to 50 percent, a ban on compulsory labor done by tenants, and some restrictions on arbitrary evictions. Extremely basic protections that the students had already pointed out wouldn't be enough to solve the actual problem. And when the Senate discussed it in 1965, many of them straight up didn't bother coming back to finish the discussion after recess. There was a clear disinterest in the Ethiopian bourgeois administrative class to actually get anything done that lessened their wealth. That same month on February 25th, students gathered in the dining hall for a rally where UCU President Baru Tumsa and Brahane Mescalreta both spoke and stressed the students' responsibility to work to better the lives of the Ethiopian people. They then marched to Parliament, where they submitted a petition, and then continued marching through the city. The reaction from the university was swift. Unable to morally condemn the students, the university instead went after them for wasting resources by missing classes and demanded that all UCU activities be subject to staff supervision. The students obviously weren't willing to give up that autonomy, so the UCU was dissolved, and its newly elected organizing committee, which included Berhane Mescaloreta, Zeru Kishan, Gebru Geberwald, Hailu Gebru Johannes, Sayom Wolde Johannes, Taye Gormu, Johannes Sibatu, Michael Abebe, and Habte Georgis Mulat were all suspended. The Land to the Tiller demonstration affected a profound change in the students. Students were dismissed because of it, and they experienced hardships as a consequence. However, the solidarity was high. I shared a residence with two of them. I believe I should be discreet regarding this matter because it was confidential but I did feel its impact when I came back from Bahir Dar. Although there had been earlier some visible signs of left-wing tendencies in the form of discussion clubs, they had substantially proliferated thereafter. This is a result of the land to the Tiller demonstration. In May, the students took the issue directly to the emperor himself and argued against the suspensions, only to be met with condescending reprimands about petitioning through proper channels and empty assurances that he would look into the issue. The nine students remained suspended and the university doubled down on its justifications. Despite this loss, the students were galvanized, and student publications at home and abroad expressed support for the protests and welcomed a new era of protest and resistance. This was the students' second ever demonstration at home, and they were extremely proud of their achievement, even if it was minimal. Abroad, students faced similar troubles, protesting in solidarity. When the Ethiopian ambassador to America, Berhane Dinki, resigned in protest of the conditions of Ethiopians and the lack of change for them in early April that year, Isuna's executive council released a statement voicing their support for his act of protest. The government responded by demanding three members of Isuna's executive council immediately return to Ethiopia or have their passports suspended. This all marks the beginning of a pattern of escalations between the students and the government. The next major protest the students would stage would be the Is Poverty a, would be the Is Poverty a Crime demonstrations. These protests came to pass when allegedly an American tourist couple leaked pictures they had taken of a concentration camp to the Ethiopian students. This camp, dubbed the Shola Concentration Camp, was basically a massive homeless shelter that the state had forced the homeless populations of Addis Ababa into. The pictures were exhibited on the university's campuses, and in May, the National Union of Ethiopian University Students, NUEUS, staged a peaceful demonstration in Addis Ababa, demanding the closure of the Shola camp. About 2,000 students took part in this demonstration, and NUEUS distributed a public statement entitled, Is Poverty a Crime? The statement described the conditions of the camp as very inhuman and unknown in the history of Ethiopia. It expressed a view that such an attempt to hide poverty through a semi-Nazi concentration camp system was a direct governmental attack on the majority of Ethiopian people, who consist of 90% poor, diseased, and illiterate. The demonstrators also carried placards that read, among others, richer getting richer, poorer getting poorer, poverty is a crime, in Ethiopia and closed the Shola concentration camp. The students attempted to march on parliament but were blocked by city police who then used clubs to disperse them. The protests the students staged culminated in a tense confrontation with the police at Rasmakonin Bridge, 
where the police use tear gas and beatings to attempt to curb the students, but ultimately fail. Unlike previous protests, these were well received by the public, and according to Bariswadi, people who had been forcibly detained in the camps actually attempted to come onto campus to thank students directly, and when they were stopped by guards, they were greeted by the students themselves. Broadly, the public was in support of this action and its success. The demonstration takes its name from an exchange with Abi Ababi, the Senate General, where students asked him, is poverty a crime? To which he responded, we are all poor. Which is quite the take to have in a discussion about a concentration camp for homeless people coming from a politician. This was only the third actual public demonstration the students had gone on, and the growing success and frequency of even milder forms of student resistance were beginning to trouble the empire. Naturally, their next step was to attempt to find ways to legislate student resistance into irrelevance. This law was set to come into effect on April 11th, so naturally the students set their protest against the anti-protest bill for April 10th, right before it went into effect. The law required students to have a permit to protest seven days beforehand, required the names and addresses of organizers to be shared with authorities, all signs and slogans had to be approved, there could be no dangerous articles present, and a permit could be rejected on the basis of any of these violations. Violating this law could result in a thousand dollar fine and a year in prison. For the students, this made public demonstration against Haile Selassie's regime basically impossible, and when they protested against it on April 10th, cops spent the day beating and tear-gassing students into submission. There were over 120 arrests and dozens of students reported injuries. On the afternoon of April 10th, some 1,500 to 1,700 students assembled at a Rotkilo campus with the aim of demonstrating against the proclamation. As they marched from the football field where they had assembled to the main gate, they found it closed and the campus surrounded by police. Then followed a period of frantic negotiations involving university officials, members of SAC, student leaders, and police officers, including General Yilma Sibishi, the chief of police. After initially appearing to consent to the students staging the demonstration, on submission of a list of student leaders who could be held responsible for the peaceful conduct of the demonstration, the authorities appeared to have changed their mind. Following some taunts and jeers, stones were thrown from inside the campus, and police did what they had been smarting to do all along. They stormed the campus, applying a liberal dosage of tear gas and clubs. They spared no one, attacking indiscriminately not just the students who had assembled to protest, but also faculty and foreign students who were not part of it. By the end of the mayhem, some 50 students had suffered injuries that required hospitalization, some 450 students had been detained, and the damage to property was finally estimated at $10,000. Students subjected to arrest were made to perform various physical punishments, ranging from intense exercise to beatings and meaningless hard labor. While their older peers were in jail, high school students chanted in support of defying the new bill and in solidarity with those in prison. Along with the high school students, the Teachers Association, EUTA, also got involved, criticizing the violent police response, what was essentially a police raid and a riot that destroyed school property, and a failure to uphold a promise to allow the rally to take place, as well as demanding the release of their students. Things escalated as the government tried to force students to return to class, which they refused to do until the detained students were released. Things remained at a standoff until the remaining students in jail had been released. With that demand met, the students returned to class and the regime extended the deadlines they'd set as a threat in order to allow them to do so. April 10th was later declared by ESANA to be Students' Movement Day in celebration of the victory. At the end of 1968, university students were on strike again demanding the restoration of their freedom to organize and to express their views through their publications. This time, the authorities yielded to the students' demands. Students were allowed their associations and publications, while properties removed earlier during the year from the offices of the NUEUS and USUAA were returned. As a further move to appease the students, Disciplinary probations imposed earlier on student activities were lifted in February of 1969. The university took steps to prevent student action from getting out of hand again in the future, over the course of the next year, developing new procedures for how to respond to students being unruly. These plans quickly became relevant when students decided to protest a fashion show put on by an American student counselor, Linda Thistle, as a means of protesting Western influence and criticizing female students who participated in it for falling to Western influence and being distracted from the movement by Thistle. This was one of the student movement's more misguided attempts to draw women in Ethiopia into the struggle, and is one of its less interesting actions in all honesty. 
Long story short, a small group of students without official approval from UCAA or NUES decided to protest the fashion show by throwing eggs and tomatoes at guests. The lack of relevance or utility in the action is shown by the fact that other students were ambivalent toward it and didn't really bother to participate, and the needless arrests that came from it solidified that feeling. The dean of the school, another American, saw the moment as another potential upsurge and preemptively closed the schools. This worsened the relations between faculty and students, especially as many students relied on the school cafeteria for regular meals and had nowhere to go. Once again, faculty had to step in and object to the collective punishment of the students and push for the school to be reopened. But while the fashion show incident is interesting in its own right, the more important influx comes in 1969. High school students in a town called Debre Berhan in Shoah had begun protesting and boycotting classes in order to push for the waiving of school fees, improvements of conditions within the schools, and against the arbitrary dismissals of students. These protests gave the movement its first martyr, when a student named Shifar Akibide was killed as police suppressed the student protest. This moment acted as an upswell as students rallied over their dead peer. As student protests over the murder of a protester escalate, so do their demands. Students began to both boycott classes and disrupt ongoing classes, demanding a total overhaul to the education system, the waiving of school fees, restructured curricula, and addressing the failure rate of students within the schools and more. Within a week, this local grievance had been transformed into a general demand for education reform. The list of demands now included not only the lifting of school fees, particularly the school leaving certificate examination fees, but also the dismissal of the Minister of Education, the equitable allocation of scholarship awards, the augmentation of the government education budget, and the expulsion of Indian teachers and American Peace Corps volunteers. Gradually, these demands snowballed into a call a fundamental overhaul of the educational system, including the alien nature and hence social irrelevance of the school syllabus, and the high attrition rate. These demands effectively became the signal for a nationwide boycott of classes by high school and university students. The Selassie regime responded swiftly, using television and radio using television and radio broadcasts to disparage students and undermine popular support, somewhat unsuccessfully. That March, Selassie himself met with student leaders to have demands met, including the dropping of charges against students who had been arrested for protesting. But this meeting went nowhere as he flat out refused to meet demands. Once again, the teachers tried reasoning with the emperor and made a little more progress, with him hinting at potentially pardoning students once their trials and sentencing were complete, and reinstating students who had been dismissed for protesting, including Brahani Meskel Reda, Johannes Sabatu, Zeru Kishan, Gebru Geberwald, Tisfu Kidane, Mesfin Habtu, and Mesfin Kasu. Despite these smaller demands being met, students continued to agitate for the other broader reforms, and the movement grew. At its height, these protests saw over 76.5 thousand students involved. Nine schools had to close as students both refused to come to class and continued to disrupt ongoing classes. A police report at the time alleges 2,775 detained, 377 charged with crimes, 60 people charged for supporting the student movement, and two students dead. One martyr, Demike Zuedi, was killed after falling from a police van, as students attempted to stop a police transport that had been kidnapping students off the street to take to police training centers to be detained. Another, Takili Weldi Hawariat, died fighting cops that November. Students abroad also participated, seizing embassies in Moscow, Paris, Washington, Berlin, and Stockholm, where they smashed pictures of Haile Selassie. Eventually, the cracks began to show as students began to split over resuming classes or continuing the boycott. Students accuse each other of being saboteurs for being against the boycotts, while others accuse the radical students of hypocrisy for disrupting classes while demanding education reform, and for striking over issues that didn't directly affect them. Anti-strike students allegedly wrote pamphlets denouncing their classmates, though it is in question if these were actually produced by students or not. The arrested students, Walalin Mekonen, Gedichu Sharu, Fintahun Tirune, Ayalu Aklog, and Gezagen Mekonen, were sentenced on April 29th for fomenting violence among the students by spreading foreign pamphlets and foreign influence. The viciousness of this series of protests, the regular confrontations with and beatings from police, as well as the sentencing of their classmates to jail, would rock the student movement. That, along with the martyrs already made from the struggle, pushed the students to become increasingly desperate, but it was the coming tragedy that would push them to greater radicalism.
the announcement of, of Mr. Andrew Ketchell uh, as Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. Along with the shooting of the students. Well, how many students were shot? Were shot so many, but... Uh, you know, that, sure, includes, right? that includes high school students and yeah. others, yeah. and therefore yeah. the information I got may not be dependable. Could, could you explain again your, your position with regard to the emperor and his status? Well, I, I hope and I think these are one of the last days of his power. On September 11, 1969, the regime bent to several student demands, removing the Minister of Education waiving school fees and granting amnesty to the sentenced students after just four months in prison. This marked a major victory for the student movement post the Shifra al-Kabide killing and subsequent upswell, and encouraged students to continue struggling. The catalyst of this change was the threat by EUS members to boycott their classes. These teachers made up such an important part of the education system in Ethiopia that the boycott would essentially make it impossible to continue classes. The 29th of September marked the official end of the strike by students. This victory did nothing to queer the students' radicalism, and the government, fearing the increasingly radical and increasingly influential student movement, began creating secret plans with the police on quelling student uprisings. This allegedly included kill and detention lists of prominent student activists. It was the murder of one of these prominent activists, Tilahun Jaza, that set off the next major conflict with the regime. On Sunday, December 28, 1969, while out on a date with his girlfriend at a Fencho bar in Addis Ababa, two men approached Tilahun Jaza and shot him three times. The shooter was later identified as police officer Berhanu Mecca. Tilahun himself was taken to Haile Selassie Hospital, where he died of his wounds before he could be operated on. The students took his body to the medical facility on the main campus to be autopsied there, and an upswell of student activity began brewing as students gathered en masse at Sadist Kilo campus the next day. By 12 p.m. Monday, over 1,500 students had gathered carrying signs condemning the murder of Tilahun Jaza. When the police later arrived on campus to retrieve his body in order to bring it to his half-sister, another conflict ensued as the students had their own plans to hold a funeral procession and take the body to his father's house. At around 2.45 p.m., the bodyguard unit filed into the campus and took a position behind the assembled students and then charged with bayonets fixed. There was shooting originating from the students according to the police report, but the only dead and wounded were students. The final tally had three students dead. Shibatu Wubni, a second year student who was apparently chanting slogans over a megaphone at the time, Jamal Hassan, a second year art student, and Abibe Berhe, a freshman in the physical science stream. Sixteen students were wounded. Also wounded on both legs was a Polish political science professor named Professor Sholdrinski, ironically very much a supporter of the regime. The military force managed to snatch away the body and hand it over to the police, who were waiting outside the gate, and the body was carried in an ambulance to the outskirts of the city for immediate transport to Tilahun's birthplace in Maichu, where it was buried on Tuesday the 30th of December, in the presence of some 500 people, including his half-sister and the governor of the province, Ras Mengesha Seyon. In the end, 27 student organizers were identified and arrested, and the students and faculty were left in chaos. The faculty were particularly frustrated with the situation as they had their own staff injured by police as well as students and had not been aware that the raid was going to happen, not to mention the thousands in destroyed school property by cops. The student response was delayed by the fact that many were left unsure what to do. Student unions were banned as well as publications, leaving few avenues for struggle. Some opted to leave Ethiopia in exodus. Some refused to boycott classes and return to normalcy hoping for an end to the violence and others began seriously discussing the continuation of struggle in a more militant form. In 1968, a group of students began clandestinely organizing a new group called Meison, or the All Ethiopian Socialist Movement. There had been previous calls within student publications and within ESUNA for the creation of a more explicitly political organization, and in 1966, with the blessing of then ESUNA president, Hagos G. Jesus, a committee was established to create a draft charter for the party to present at the next ESANA Congress. It was the European wing of the movement in ESUE that would eventually approve a constitution for the organization that grew into Maison in 1967. These early preparations culminated in the first general meeting of the steering group on April 16, 1968 at the city of Malmo in Sweden. The meeting elected 25 founding members of Maison on the basis of their participation in the student movement, their espousal of Marxist-Leninist ideology, and their personal character. The founding congress of the organization was held in the northern German city of Hamburg on 1 through 6th, on the 1st 
through 6th of August, 1968. With the exception of Hagos G. Jesus and Melissa Yelu, who were leaders of ESUNA, all other founding members were from ESUE. Other members of the ESUNA leadership, Alim Habtu, Andreas Ishite, Desaline Romato, Haile Menkirios, Henok Kifle, and Tamrat Kabide were also inducted into the organization. But according to both Alim and Tamrat, some of them were completely unaware of their membership. Their names apparently haven't been given by Hagos, who also apparently withdrew their names when he disassociated himself from the organization following the subsequent divergence of views. Plane hijackings became a popular mode of armed struggle for radical students. It allowed them to escape the country to other socialist countries for training and popularize their struggle and gain attention. One group of students, including Brahane Mescalareta, Abdisa Ayana, Emmanuel Gabriel Jesus, Benya Madane, Iyasu Alameyahu, Gezagen Endale, and Haile Jesus Woldensevet, had already that August hijacked a flight on Ethiopian Airlines out of Gondar and flew to Khartoum, Sudan, and then later found sanctuary in Algiers. There, they hoped to gain training and organize for the next phase of their struggle. This group, dubbed the Algiers Group, would go on to form the EPLO, which would evolve into the EPRP later on in the revolutionary process. Another group of students, including Wellenin Mekonen, Martha Mebratu, Johannes Fikida, Bele Tedisi, Gedichu Habte, Tedelik Kidane Miriam, and Tesfaye Berega, attempted a hijacking on December 8, 1972. This ended in disaster, as all but one of the hijackers was killed and several passengers were injured, although the plane was safely landed. The killing was deeply felt by the student movement, especially true in the case of Martha, who was an extremely prominent figure in the student movement. Her manifesto, written the night before the attack, was widely circulated among the students. We women of Ethiopia and Eritrea have made our life ready to participate in a struggle, and we would like to explain the nature of our struggle to our sisters and brothers all over the world. Our struggle demands a bitter sacrifice in order to liberate our oppressed and exploited people from the yokes of feudalism and imperialism. In this struggle, we have to be bold and merciless. Our enemies can only understand such language. We women must equally participate in the struggle for economic and social justice that our brothers have waged. We have a responsibility to become a formidable force in the Revolutionary Army. We affirm our full support for the oppressed peoples of the world who are struggling to free themselves from imperialism, colonialism, neocolonialism, and racism. We stand by the freedom fighters in Vietnam, Palestine, Guinea-Bissau, and other African and Latin American countries. We also support the civil rights leaders in North America. Victory to the popular struggle of the people. May the people's movement for freedom in both Ethiopia and Eritrea live forever. My sisters and my brothers, let's keep on fighting. While older students were unable to struggle due to closure of schools, refusing to when classes restarted, or fleeing, high school students in Ethiopia continued protesting militantly. They burned rich people's cars and attacked buses in order to protest bus fares, set vigils on local markets to enforce fair prices on grain for the poor, and formed sophisticated local student councils as well as national councils to coordinate activities between local groups. At the same time that the student movement and the struggle for socialism in Ethiopia was intensifying in terms of repression, splits among the students were also, and the national question began to crack the movement in two. It was the outbreak of the Eritrean struggle for independence in 1961 that began the tensions. Post-World War II, Eritrea was placed under British military administration in 1941. In 1947, when the Treaty of Peace came into effect, the Four Powers Commission, a group of major powers that included the US, the Soviet Union, England, and France, set about the duty to create a government in Eritrea. On December 2, 1950, the UN General Assembly approved a resolution to federate Eritrea into Ethiopia, meaning that Eritrea had some internal autonomy but was still under the Ethiopian crown. This move was especially beneficial for Selassie, who got access to the sea through Eritrea, and the US, who got to place bases in Asmara and Mitsawa. On March 26, 1952, the Eritrean Representative Assembly was elected to office and subsequently held its first vote to ratify a constitution that they had drafted on July 10, 1952. Haile Selassie ratified said constitution on August 11 and officially federated Eritrea on September 15 that same year. Within Eritrea, there existed political tensions between pro-Ethiopian nationalists and Eritrean nationalists. Pro-independence nationalists were harassed by the Selassie regime, which worked over the course of half a decade to slowly degrade what little autonomy Eritrea had, even replacing politicians who were in favor of him for not being loyal enough. On September 30, 1952, Emperor Haile Selassie issued a proclamation declaring the Federal Ethiopian Court to be the final court of appeal in Eritrea. 
the Eritrean Assembly adopted a resolution condemning Ethiopian interference in Eritrean affairs on May 22, 1954. Emperor Haile Selassie forced the resignation of Chief Executive Otto Tedla Bayru in July 1955. Emperor Haile Selassie appointed Asfeha Woldemichael as Chief Executive and Idris Mohamed Adem as President of the Eritrean Assembly in August 1955. Selassie's creeping grip on Ethiopia, the banning of languages, upheaval of their politics, and marginalization of Eritreans within Ethiopia proper pushed Eritrean independence to greater radicalism, and in 1960, they formed the Eritrean Liberation Front, a coalition of nationalist, socialist, and democratic forces, as well as both Christian and Muslim Eritreans. The ELF's official birth took place in Cairo on July 10, 1960, with exiled Eritreans Idris Mohamed Adem, Idris Osman Gelawedos, and Mohamed Saleh Hamid. For the next 30 years, they would wage war for Eritrean independence. Though the ELF sought and received military assistance from People's China, its backers included a number of Arab nationalist regimes, and its social radicalism was limited. The front split in 1970, spawning what became the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, which quickly gained a reputation for being much more radical than the ELF, and less identified with the Muslim population. The EPLF eventually came to dominate, and its Chinese-trained leader, Isaiah Safwerki, is today the leader of the independent Eritrean state. The student movement's reaction to this was mixed. For one, harassment for Eritrean students on campus was fairly common, and occasionally fights broke out. When the war began, many students and non-student Eritreans were accused of being tools for Arab states and Muslim extremists. Selassie's regime worked hard to distance Eritreans from Ethiopians and force Eritreans to essentially denounce their own decolonization to avoid being marginalized. Student radicals were left confused on whether or not the Eritrean struggle should be supported and the lack of support from other students made Eritrean students feel sequestered and isolated from the broader movement. This was the first crack, and it didn't improve from here. It was the late, although not at the time, Wallin McConan, who died in the 1972 raid, who made the question explode in 1969. His piece on the question of nationalities in Ethiopia, published on November 17, 1969, brought the question to the forefront with a radical pro-secession stance. He essentially believed that the various ethnic groups in Ethiopia, including the Oromo, Amhara, Tigre, Somali, etc., constituted multiple nations, and that these nations were owed autonomy up to and including secession, in the case of progressive secessionist movements. Wallalin describes Ethiopian nationalism in its current state, at the time, as a mask for Amhara nationalism. He also describes the Tigre as playing a role of secondary oppressor class to the Amhara, he explains that any tribe could have become the primary oppressor in the Ethiopian context. His hope was that by acknowledging the various national groups in Ethiopia and the complex oppressive relationships that they have to the Ethiopian state, a genuine multinational state could be created. I am for all of them, the ELF, the Baal movements, the Gojam uprising, to the extent that they have challenged and weakened the existing regime and have created areas of discontent to be harnessed later on by the genuine socialist revolution. One thing is certain. I do not oppose these movements just because they are secessionists. There is nothing wrong with secessionism. As such, it is our backwardness and selfishness to ask a people to be partners in being exploited until you can catch up. Much like Eritrea, the other provinces of Ethiopia had often existed in autonomous relation to each other. It wasn't until the conquest of Menelik II in the late 1800s that an Ethiopian state actually began to appear. The relation of other Ethiopian peoples, especially groups in the southern regions of Ethiopia such as the Oromo, to the newly created state was a colonial one. Menelik's rule and Haile Selassie's subsequently were both marked by repression of regional rebellions, conquest, and the removal of their leaders for those favorable to the current regime. The colonial relations between the state and the peoples of Ethiopia are extensive and brutal. Beyond mere restrictions on language and Amhara hegemony, Addis Ababa was built on stolen Oromo lands, a common occurrence due to land alienation campaigns carried out by Haile Selassie in 1943 and Menelik in the 1800s. The Afar, a nomadic people, saw their ability to travel freely, damaged by the machinations and development of the Ethiopian state. In 1974, they saw their lands destroyed by the redirection of the Awash River to the Dubti Valley in order to provide water for cotton crops. Villages were not informed beforehand, and 3,000 people lost their homes, while over 100 people were dead or missing. These are common images in Ethiopia, and many of the famines that rocked the various regions under Haile Selassie were the direct result of colonial land use and agricultural practices. As a result, I think it's a fair historical fact to describe the Ethiopian state's relationship to the various peoples forced to participate as a colonial one. 
Haile Selassie's degradation of Eritrean autonomy is a prime example. Eritrean students were further alienated in 1968 when NUES voted to condemn regional nationalism, and the failure of the students to find common ground with Eritreans among them is one of the factors that leads the revolution down a path of failure. Several major student publications responded to Walu and Mekonen, and each other. These were Tilahun Tekili, a pseudonym used by the Algiers group, the students who fled to Algeria and were in favor of the right to secession. Tumto Lencho, another pseudonym for ESUNA members delivering on the subject, Hagos Gebreyesus and Melissa Ayalu, and Alem Habtu. TL wrote, The fact that the new era of proletarian revolution places a socialist program before the proletariat everywhere does not mean that the popular masses in the colonial and dependent countries in which bourgeois democratic revolution is yet unaccomplished are to overlook or surpass democratic tasks. The changes affected in the agenda of the toiling masses of the backward countries in the proletarian revolution are quite complex. Once socialism has become the order of the day and its main historical agents are recognized to be the toiling masses under the leadership of the proletariat, national demands, like all democratic demands, are secondary to the tasks of the socialist revolution. Once we enter the era of the proletarian revolution, support for national demands that do not form part of the socialist revolution against capitalism and imperialism, and national movements that impair the united force of the oppressed of all nationalities led by the proletariat is out of the question. To be very brief and simplistic, the movement essentially split into two camps on this question. One camp was in support of autonomy up to and including secession, under the belief that supporting that right, even in the case of movements without the same political line, would foster genuine trust between peoples and encourage people to stay within the state of Ethiopia. And the other camp believed in supporting national liberation, but not secession, and only supporting the former if the movement was sufficiently socialist. The lines between these organizations were essentially just semantic, as both major wings of the coming split would essentially take the same action when the time came to answer this question. Maison and the Algiers group had been in communication via liaison. One of Maison's leadership and founding members, Haile Fida. He had been in talks with members of the Algiers group, trying to bring them into the fold of the still secret Maison. These talks were made difficult for a number of reasons, but it was the aftermath of the 19th Isuna Congress in 1971 that finally split the movement for good. This congress took place after the ESUE Congress in July of that year, held in Berlin. There, the students had voted on a resolution in favor of the Tilhun Tekili thesis and in favor of national liberation for the various nations within Ethiopia. When the issue came to the U.S. to be put to vote in ESUNA, there was high tension in the air. The points of contention included whether or not nations can exist in a pre-capitalist setting or not and why the national question had assumed such a central importance in the Ethiopian student movement at that particular time. The ESUNA leadership and its supporters rallied behind the 1970 issue of Challenge and the resolutions of the 17th Congress. The opposing group brandished the Tilahun Tekili thesis, which had in the meantime been published in a newsletter of the New York chapter, a veritable stronghold of the opposition. Curiously enough, there was hardly any reference to the more elaborate exposition of the ESUNA position in Tumto Lencho's article of July 1971. The debate centered on the concept of region that had been central to the 1969 resolutions and the papers that formed its scientific basis, a term that ESUNA leadership was not very much prepared to defend anymore, and whether there were nationalities or nations in Ethiopia. To the latter question, Mesfin Habtu, a leading member of the TT group, gave the standard answer, saying that there were nationalities fast developing into nations, but more research had to be done to determine which nationalities had fast developed into nations. In addition, the TT group pointed out the damage that the 1969 ESUNA stand had done in alienating Eritrean members of the student movement and pushing them to form a separate organization, Eritreans for Liberation in North America. Finally, the matter had to be put to vote, the TT group tabling the resolutions adopted at the 11th ESUE Congress in Berlin. But before that could be done, the ESUNA leadership raised the issue of bona fide membership in order to qualify to vote. The chairman came up with the compromise formula of all members with outstanding membership fees, paying their arrears, and then being qualified to vote. The proposal was accepted by Mesfin on behalf of the TT group and rejected by Sine for the opposing one. The meeting was adjourned and re-registration was carried out. In the vote that followed, the TT motion secured 53 votes compared to 35 for the resolution tabled by Sine. At this point, Sine declared that he disassociated himself from the Congress and walked out, followed by a number of those supporting his position. That walkout marked the split of ESUNA into two, for what happened was that Sine and his followers met in another venue soon after, adopted their own resolutions on the national question, and elected a new executive committee. 
These resolutions, while they called upon all revolutionaries to struggle for the unconditional demand for the right to self-determination of all the peoples and regions of Ethiopia, enjoined on them to insist that the exercise of the right to self-determination, including secession, be conditional on the adoption of a clear anti-feudal and anti-imperialist program, and the subordination of the question of nationalities to the demands of class struggle. Thus there prevailed for some years the confusing situation of two organizations with the same name, ESUNA, sometimes referred to as Old ESUNA, and New ESUNA, an identical organ's challenge. Various efforts, largely half-hearted on both sides, were made to mend the split, but these unity talks as they came to be known bore no fruit. The last round of these talks, held between January and June of 1973, founded on conflicting interpretations of the causes of the split. The new ESUNA group arguing that their rivals caused the split by walking out on the 19th Congress, and the latter insisting that it was the former who had already walked out on the organization by abandoning the common platform of anti-feudalism and anti-imperialism, and giving the national question a preeminent position in the student movement. Let's take a step back and trace some of these threads. We have Maison, led by Khaled Fida and primarily in control of ESUE European leadership, then Brahane Mesolreda as one of the leaders of then EPLO. These are two clandestine parties, one of which has major pull over European students via ESUE, the other in America. Then we have old ESUNA, which is led by Dr. Sine Liki, and new ESUNA, which is led by the newly elected Mesfin Habtu. Old ESUNA consists of the nationalist anti-non-socialist secession group, and new ESUNA, though not officially affiliated with EPLO, Algeria leadership, shares a similar line. Acrimony between old and new ESUNA grew more intense as the two groups harshly criticized each other's publications and engaged in verbal and literary sparring matches, accusing each other of being rightist and reactionaries. The old ESUNA labeling the new ESUNA as infantile, adventurous leftists, and so forth. One of the culminations of this conflict, and one of the most damning marks against Sine Liki, was the suicide of Mesfin Haptu. Haptu was elected to leadership of new ESUNA after Sine walked out and forfeited his position. Haptu was elected to leadership of new ESUNA after Sine walked out and forfeited his position, and he was immediately subject to Leaky's political maneuverings. Sine leaked to the public the private correspondences of Mesbin Haptu, showing that he and his allies were planning to soon return home to Ethiopia to engage in armed struggle. I don't find it necessary to explain how this is snitching behavior. This actually took place at the ESUE Congress in July before the major split in August that year. In the following months, those who knew Mesfin would say that he fell into a deep depression, and likely unable to safely return to Ethiopia considering his insurrectionist plans had been leaked, he killed himself on November 1st, 1971. Meanwhile, Haile Fida was not one to lose the opportunity to engage in his own political maneuvering. Fida headlined attempts to bring the Algiers group into the fold of Maison in early 1971, but these attempts proved fruitless as divisions over the national question grew, and the Algiers group was already secretly underway creating the EPLO and recruiting for it, although they wouldn't declare its official formation until 1972. Although Haile Fida and Sine Liki would officially end up as allies under the dirge, they initially were on different sides of the unfolding splits. In April 1972, Haile Fida and Dr. Elihu Filiki, then president of ESUE, came to New York and met separately with both old and new ESUNA leaders, meaning the Sine and pro-EPLO factions respectively. Presumably they wanted to have their own take on the field of play in North America. As an aside or not, Haile Fida met with Maison members Melissi Ayalu and Desilene in the apartment they shared with me. Melissi told me that he had secured Haile Fida's consent to have me join the meeting, although I was not a member, but was made privy to his existence in June 1971. A member of Maison who was visiting from Addis and was staying with us also joined the meeting. Two items struck me at that meeting and have stayed with me ever since. One was that Haile Fida was asking Melissi and Desolene about whether or not they would accept Maison's secret directive to move to a neighboring country, Sudan. The two responded that they first wanted to discuss the substantive issues of the objective and subjective conditions for a revolutionary situation in Ethiopia, including the national question. Haile Fida insisted that they would have to accept the Secretariat's directive first before substantive issues could be discussed. Due to this deadlock, no substantive discussion took place. Haile Fida impressed me as an organizational man, not as a reflective thinker. The second item was what transpired as a result of my persistent question of why ESUE had abruptly told us to stop all communications with the Algeria group. Haile Fida finally said that he was afraid that an alliance would be created between old ESUNA leaders, who he said were more advanced in the social sciences than their ESUE counterparts, and the Algerian group at the expense of those leaders in Europe. At this point, the Maison visitor from Adi spoke for the first and only time. Haile, that is stupid. Simply stupid. 
It became clear to me from this meeting that Haile Fida was preoccupied with the issue of political power above all else. Maison leaders and role slash EPRP leaders had forged a marriage of convenience against old ESUNA in order to sideline the latter. The new ESUNA wing made its own connections, having resolutions condemning massacres of Eritreans in Karen by the Ethiopian government and forming tenuous though existing connections with the newly formed EFLNA, Eritreans for Liberation in North America. It, like ESUE and ESUNA, had parallel European organizations, and they were for a time the youth wings of the EPLF. The two organizations, EFLNA and New ESUNA, held joint protests in DC after the 1972 failed hijacking and were an allyship until the mid-70s as splits further plagued the EPLF and ELF. The splits within the student movement weren't confined to the national question either. For one, EPLO leadership and Maison leadership saw the unfolding revolutionary situation at home differently. EPLO leadership, Berhane Mescolreda especially, believed that the revolution was to unfold soon and that they needed to form political parties and an armed organization to prepare for the moment to unfold. Haile Fida personally didn't think the revolution would come for another 25 years, and Maison as an organization was seeking to play the longer game. As the splits in the movement grew and intensified, so too did the personal rivalries behind them. Haile Fida and Brahane Mescal Reda were notoriously antagonistic to each other, and were often seen arguing when they were in person. One evening, Brahane Mescal Reda and Haile Fida were having an argument. Both men's veins stood out, and people kept their distance, apprehensive that an explosion was in the offing. When we were both in prison, I had the opportunity to ask Haile what it was all about. He replied, we were telling each other that he would be answerable for it later. We all know the fateful consequences of those differences. until 1974, as a drought and feudalist extraction plagued Tigrayan Wallow regions of Ethiopia. The Wallow famine would kill over 200,000 people, as Emperor Haile Selassie would continue to live as if nothing happened. His regime worked to suppress information on the famine, and kept foreign governments from commentating on the ongoing crisis. As the famine went on, cracks began to show in Haile Selassie's regime. OPEC embargoes drove the price of gas up in Ethiopia, making taxi drivers go on strike. At the same time, 18,000 teachers decided to walk off the job going on strike. And on top of this, Ethiopia's only union, CELU, declared a general strike. The Confederation of Ethiopian Labor Unions, or CELU, was founded in 1962. It was created with the sponsorship of pro-imperialist forces in world labor. That is to say, the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, or AFL-CIO, who hoped to create a captive, docile labor organization with whom the business community could cooperate, forestalling more militant working class organization, while claiming to promote the free organization of workers. Of course, it wasn't CELU's original intention to become a breeding ground for Ethiopian Bolsheviks. It's not for nothing that the AFL-CIO has been somewhat less than jokingly referred to worldwide as the AFL-CIA. Virtually every imaginable sector of the Ethiopian economy, airline workers, sex workers, priests, bus drivers, and more, went on strike and refused to work. In Addis Ababa, prisoners went on strike and were harshly suppressed. Haile Selassie tried to make major concessions, removing the prime minister and replacing him with a liberal, lowering the price of gas, and making promises to teachers. None of it mattered. While some went home, others continued to protest and riot. In the town of Jima, the regime was entirely kicked out for a time, with the police and governor being forced out of the city and replaced by a democratic council made up of local residents, 34 strong, and for several weeks, they remained in control of the town. On top of this, there were protests by Muslims in Ethiopia for equal rights, as well as demonstrations for women's rights. Even the military, Haile Selassie's regime's main tool of control, saw its lower-ranked officers begin revolting as well. By all accounts, the revolution was legitimately taking place. As students at Ethiopian embassies worldwide struggled, 
the various wings of the student movement debate their next move. Mason members make their way home to Ethiopia, with Haile Fida opening a bookstore to distribute literature to the newly radicalized Ethiopian people in Addis Ababa. Rahane Mescaloreta and his allies make the journey to Ethiopia on foot through Eritrea, searching for a base of operations to begin armed struggle. Other EPLO members return to Addis Ababa in July, and with Tesfaya Debese sitting on the editorial board, begin printing Democracia, a revolutionary pamphlet passed hand to hand and printed in the hundreds of thousands illegally. This pamphlet advocated for the overthrow of the emperor and the establishment of a popular provisional government and socialist democracy. It would later become one of the main opponents of the Derg. Democracy published its first issue on July 3, 1974, where it analyzed the ongoing uprisings and the origins of the struggle. Haile Fida and the Mason members who returned home with him also started their own radical organ called Voice of the Masses. The two organs became the main voice of the left in Ethiopia, starting off with a similar line and eventually diverging as the military junta took form and solidified. In April, the military had successfully demanded the arrest of the emperor's cabinet, while at the same time swearing fealty to the emperor himself, and stepped back from the uprising. But toward the end of June, a secretive committee of military officers announced itself as the coordinating committee of the armed forces, or after the Amharic word for committee, dirge for short. In what would eventually be called a slow motion coup, the dirge presented Prime Minister Indel Kachu with a list of political demands, including steps to end corruption, free political prisoners, and a revision and modernization of the constitution. The dirge proceeded to arrest dozens of members of the aristocracy and bureaucracy and loudly proclaimed, and loudly proclaimed its new slogan, Ethiopia Tikdem, or Ethiopia First. Ethiopia First was an appeal to political unity addressed to the various restive segments of Ethiopian society, but it was also a chauvinist call to national unity in the face of various separatist movements, hoping to pull advantages from the loosening bonds of the Ethiopian government. General Aman Andong served as the public face of the CCAF slash Dirge, a group of 126 military officials who oversaw the progression of the military's rise to power and the unfolding revolution itself. In July, they demanded the arrest and removal of the Prime Minister in Dolgachu, and had him replaced by Lij Mikhail Imru. But this didn't satisfy any demands. In the streets, people were chanting for Haile Selassie's head, as news and images of the worsening famine were distributed by newspapers and revolutionaries. The dirge satisfied these demands, and on September 12, 1974, they deposed and arrested Haile Selassie. Eventually, Selassie would either die of natural causes while imprisoned by the dirge, or be suffocated to death by the dirge. Either way, they had successfully taken power, basically by slowly turning a dial that says coup engaging the audience's reaction. Asfa Wosin, the emperor's son, was named emperor, not that it mattered. In a radio broadcast, the dirge made clear the new conditions. The new draft constitution will be put in effect as soon as necessary improvements are made to include provisions reflecting the social, economic, and political philosophy of the new Ethiopia and to safeguard the civil rights of the people. Meanwhile, the coordinating committee of the armed forces would hold power and run the country until legal representatives could be elected. Until then, courts would continue to function and all existing laws be valid. All strikes and demonstrations were contrary to the motto Ethiopia first and were banned. And special military courts were to be set up to deal with anyone disobeying these and any future orders. General Aman Andong, flanked by Colonel Mengetu Hailamariam and Antafu Abate, would sit at the head of the new government. The dirge ideologically had no real affiliation. Some of the generals were radically left-leaning, some were more liberal democratic, and some were outright reactionaries. Both EPRP and Meson saw that the military was in need of some sort of radical guidance. But though taking steps to work with them, democracy urged caution among the left as they dealt with the military junta, especially due to their connection to the old regime. Those of you paying attention may remember that the now late Walulin Mekonnen specifically stated in his divisive tract on the national question that a military junta could never bring about a genuine revolution in Ethiopia. And how do we achieve this genuine democratic and egalitarian state? Can we do it through the military? No. A military coup is nothing more than a change of personalities. It may be a bit more liberal than the existing regime, but it can never resolve the contradiction between either classes or nationalities. Sene Liki actually manages to politically outmaneuver his peers, and he forms his own faction, the Proletarian League. 
He uses the PL to win influence among the soldiers in the Air Force. Eventually, this ends with him having the ear of actual key members within the Dirge, and gaining actual political influence with them. He was probably one of the first among the student movement to gain that kind of leverage. He taught karate and Marxism to members of the Air Force, and eventually came to become one of Mengetsu's trusted allies, even allegedly getting to drive the car that took Haile Selassie away to be jailed and later killed. Or die of natural causes. I'm not super into the concept of emperors, so I'm pretty ambivalent either way, to be honest. The Dirge's rule in this state wasn't fully secured yet, however. On November 23, 1974, a shootout took place between General Amon and Mengetsu's factions within the Dirge, and Mengetsu came out on top. Mengetsu's Dirge faction promptly descended on the centers where prisoners collected during the past months of upsurge had been detained. Sixty high-profile prisoners were seized and executed, including two of the year's previous prime ministers, Indalgachu Makonen and Aki Luhaptawold. Joining these politicians in gruesome mass shootings were a host of ancient regime ministers, aristocrats, and nobles, including the governor of Eritrea, a grandson of the emperor, a scattering of high-ranking military official officers, and factional opponents of Mengetsu from within the dirge, and a half-dozen leftist soldiers and officers who belonged to an EPLO study cell. The bloodless revolution was no longer bloodless. The nation was shocked. Both democracy and voice of the broad masses accused the dirge of fascism. BBC correspondent Blair Thompson witnessed groups of women shrouded in jet black dresses and shawls of mourners shuffling around parts of Ethiopian around parts of the Ethiopian capital wailing and singing. Only a few teenagers, not students, seemed pleased. This is what we've been waiting for, said one. They had it coming, now the revolution can really begin. It's important to note at this point that both Maison and EPRP's publications were openly calling the Dirk fascist. To Ferry Benti, former military attaché to the U.S. was made the new head of the PMAC, and the dirge that December declared Ethiopia's new system to be socialism, and declared Ethiopian unity as an absolute truth. The dirge had seized the revolution, for better or for worse. Something yet to be fully seen. when some areas were impossible to function in. There was daily assassinations. There was time when we had to bury as much as five, six comrades per day. When number of counter-revolutionary force people, especially the agents of EPRP, were exposed and they were asked to give their hands, they were asked to, re re uh, to surrender, they wanted to resist, and because of this, they had been annihilated on the spot. And this exposed agents of the PRP, especially, were given political education, were detained by the Kabbalists, not to be shot one after the other, as I hear is said in most of the Western papers. The PMAC began multiple projects in the early months of 1975. The Zemecha, an educational development campaign, saw over 60,000 students sent from the cities to the various districts in the countryside to teach socialism and literacy to peasants, aid in public works, and other social projects. This had two goals, spreading the state's ideology and alleviating illiteracy in Ethiopia. It also allegedly, according to Ian Scott Horst, was intended to prevent the students from further agitating in the cities. The term education campaign doesn't truly capture the scope of this operation. It really was more of a public development campaign, part of the PMAC's conversion of capitalist modernization processes to socialist modernization processes instead. It entailed more than just education and literacy, but public works, public health campaigns, and more. 1.2 million people were vaccinated against diseases like smallpox, malaria, and tuberculosis. 2 million trees were planted. 1 million people received health education. 296 clinics were built as well as additional small health shelters, and there were thousands of smaller works projects building wells, latrines, garbage pits, and gardens. Overall, the program's initial first wave cost around $17 million, and the total cost of the entire program came up to about $48.6 million. Zemecha campaigners also helped establish farmer co-ops, schools, and community groups for women. The program did have its issues, however. 
If there was any intention to quell radicalism, it didn't work. While the cities were less intense in terms of radical activities, students created much agitation as they set out to change communities. Local opposition often included police, local leaders, and social leaders such as clergy, who sought to act as a counterforce to the revolution. Landlords especially were willing to get violent with campaigners. Over 116 were killed during these campaigns, as students continued to push for radical changes. There were also issues with implementation. The PMAC didn't provide these students with much training to do these jobs, and some weren't even sent the proper materials to perform their duties. While some campaigners may do getting to alleviating material conditions, some abandoned their posts, refusing to do anything other than teach political education, or refusing to get involved. Some caused acrimony among campaigners due to differences in politics, and made contradictory materials to each other. EPRP also used these spaces to recruit members, and saw decent success in doing so. Sometimes Zimics were sent to the wrong places and couldn't speak the local language. Some communities were nomadic and therefore a stable campaign couldn't be set for them. Despite these difficulties, however, the program did see some major successes. If any positive credit can be given to the dirge, of which there is sometimes very little, its literacy campaign is its most significant achievement. With 60,000 teachers participating, they taught over 160,000 people to read in a program that included 14 different languages, some of which were local and had never been given written form. Objectively, this program was pretty impressive. There were literacy programs existing before the dirge in Ethiopia. Under Menelik in 1890 and in 1908, there were decrees that every child should be educated, and there were organizations patroned by Haile Selassie that also sought to expand education. But the dirge's program was probably the most extensive, comprehensive, and successful. The most extensive and large-scale program during the Dirge regime was the National Literacy Campaign, carried out all over the country between 1979 and 1989. The Provisional Military Administrative Council, PMAC, announced a program of National Democratic Revolution in Ethiopia, NDR, in April 1976, in which it expressed its commitment to eradicate illiteracy in Ethiopia. PMC stated in the NDR that all necessary measures to eliminate illiteracy must be undertaken. The PMAC confirmed its commitment with the formation of the National Literacy Campaign Coordinating Committee in May 1979. The committee had a membership of 35 institutions, 13 relevant ministries, 3 religious institutions, and 10 other government and mass organizations. The committee was chaired by the Minister of Education at national level, but the regional and provincial and Wereda committees were chaired by their respective administrators. There were four operational committees at each level responsible for materials procurement and distribution, recruitment, training and placement, propaganda and aid coordination, and data collection, supervision, and certification. The Propaganda and Aid Coordination Committee was chaired by the Minister of Information at the national level. All the campaign offices, including Propaganda and Aid Coordination Committee, from national to the Wareda district level, were housed within the MOE structure. The campaign extended its horizons year by year and reached over 22 million people, 51.7% females, in 10 years, of which 20.3 million, 50.5% females, passed the beginner's literacy test. Over 18 million, 45.5% females, joined the post-literacy stage, and 13.8 million, 45% females, successfully completed the program. Over 51 million texts were produced and used in 15 languages in over 447,000 literacy centers in 10 years. More than 2 million, 21% female, campaigners participated, and several millions of learning materials, blackboards, exercise books, etc., were distributed. Despite the enshrining of linguistic rights across Ethiopia, Amharic did still remain the language that the state in Ethiopia used, and it was still the primary language that would be taught in schools across Ethiopia. That same year, the dirge also began nationalizing certain industries, while reserving some for private ownership or collaboration with foreign capital and working to expand public works. The state also seized empty homes, set up urban neighborhood associations called kevils, and in March announced major land reforms, making all rural land state-owned. Although there was no redistribution, they had effectively abolished feudalism as tenants no longer were made to pay landlords, and this legitimately alleviated some of their strain. The changes continued. In December, a new labor law was promulgated, which promised to guarantee the dignity of workers. The law established an official trade union federation and called for the establishment of more trade unions across the country, though the rationalizations of these unions were to be improved efficiency and production rather than worker militancy and independence. Indeed, no right to strike was enshrined in the new code. 
Hereafter in socialist Ethiopia, the dignity and worth of labor will be duly respected and all forms of exploitation abolished, with fair and just remuneration for work. The welfare of workers will be promoted by the precedence of the common good over individual gains, and workers will be made to have full participation and due share in the production process. The land reforms, though initially impressive, were ill-fated in some regions. For one, implementation was different across Ethiopia. In the south, Oromo radicals and peasants swiftly expropriated feudal lands and both received and carried out the reforms with enthusiasm. Peasant associations made up of local residents were established both for community defense and cooperative work and life. There were occasionally killings of feudal landowners as well. Peasant community associations brought local democracy to rural communities and allowed for collaboration between communities on agricultural undertakings as well as the running of schools. By 1977, there would be over 24,700 peasant associations, with 4 million Ethiopians involved. However, in the north, regions such as Shoa, Begemdir, Tigray, and Gojam saw revolt by wealthy landowners and some peasantry against the reforms, claiming that they would negatively impact peasants' wrist rights. Wrist being a system of family land tenure and inheritance that guarantees a right of use to land to all descendants of a given family. The fact that some peasants own wrist land made it easier to gain mass anti-dirge support in these areas for wealthy landowners. As mentioned a moment ago, students sent to the countryside by the Zemecha played a large role in galvanizing peasant organizing, and the pace of the process gave the dirge some pause. The conflicts between the students and landowners sometimes escalated to violence as well, and in 1975, the dirge recalled the students back to the cities temporarily, halting the program so they could rework it. Later in the revolution, the ongoing civil wars in Ethiopia would drain the state's resources and people. Literacy would begin to fall in the later stages of the dirge's rule, and would continue to fall afterwards. At its height, however, literacy in Ethiopia would reach 89%. The land reforms made would also suffer from the strain of war in the latter stages of the revolution. The dirge may have taken radical steps, but that didn't stop the brutality, nor did it grant them much moral merit in the face of such brutality. For one, the dirge harshly enforced its new laws and ruled by decree over Ethiopia. The war in Eritrea continued, both genuine counter-revolutionary forces and innocent leftists demanding further progress fell on the PMAC's blades. In August, the dirge suppressed a peasant revolt in Benchina, leading to over a thousand dead, including veterans of the anti-fascist guerrilla movement against Italian colonialism. The army's brutality had been unprecedented. For instance, the army went into a hotel and shot to death a teacher who was traveling from another town to somewhere towards Addis Ababa. When his wife, who was holding their toddler child, saw her dying husband and screamed and cried, the army turned back and killed her too. He recalls the words of a dirge member visiting the town he was staying in, saying, We will civilize Gojam until five people are left. On top of this, strikes were technically banned at this point and would remain so for several years. Labor activity was not encouraged. Demands by workers for autonomy and worker control on the factory floor and in other workplaces were not met. New labor codes in 1975 banned strikes outright and enshrined strict managerial structures overseen by the state. The political climate was tense and confusing as the dirge attempted to gain control of the radical movement and fulfill radical demands and various leftist orgs began wondering what to do next. The dirge knew their power was not secure and that popular support was the only way to keep it, yet they lacked much of the political know-how and radical education necessary to do so. So vying for civilian left support to create a marriage of convenience was their only political move. As the dirge continued to make radical steps to fulfill that goal, Mayasan and EPRP were once again in talks to collaborate. But the hesitant attitude toward the dirge they once both shared began to wane. Khaila Fida had come to believe that the dirge represented Mayasan's only real shot at political relevance in Ethiopia, and saw critical support of the dirge's progressive steps as necessary to remain politically viable. The talks with EPRP fizzled out as Khaila Fida made his choice and the EPRP negotiator Kiflu Tadisi was forced to go underground. With Khaila Fida crawling back to Sine Liki's allyship, a man he once intentionally politically sidelined and kind of a known snitch, Rahana Mescolreta and Kiflu Tadisi, and the editors and disseminators of democracy waged literary warfare and steeled themselves for potentially a violent struggle as an underground organ. Mason enjoyed several benefits of being under the dirge's wing. For one, they were no longer an underground organization and could work freely within the dirge to spread their particular agenda. Khaila Fida himself gained similar status to Sine Liki, and Mason directly advised and suggested several of the previously mentioned reforms to them. On top of that, they could now use their new position within the state to attack and discredit their opponents within EPRP. While during this period the differences were still expressed politically, Mason began to sharply criticize EPRP, accusing them in its voice of the masses of being in de facto alliance with the EDU and with the ELF's 
alleged reactionary sponsors in the Arab world. The dissent into name-calling, which was certainly not one-sided, voted ill for resolution of the left's differences. In August of 1975, the EPRP officially announced its existence to Ethiopia. Their program, while more progressive than the dirge in some ways, is mildly disappointing, and their stance on the national question, while calling for an end to the war in Eritrea, doesn't do much to advocate for independence or national liberation, but full rights and participation within the Ethiopian state. Their hesitance to refer to the Eritrean situation as a specifically colonial one would further drive a later fatal wedge between the EPLF and EPRP. EPRP also harshly criticized the dirge, going so far as to call them social chauvinists and fascists, and criticized Meson for taking the side of the junta in the struggle. EPRP continued to struggle. With over 5,000 members and thousands more supporters, they were a powerful political contender, despite struggling on the back foot due to being technically illegal and facing repression. In 1975, members established another journal called Go, which was run by two Ethiopian women. On top of that, CELU, which had at this point become a hub of EPRP support and far more radical than it was ever meant to be when Selassie's regime established it, continued to be one of the organs calling for popular provisional governance. The dirge arrested some of the union's leadership and tried to shut down the organizing, citing the union's pre-revolution past as an organ of dominance by foreign capital. But workers argued back, citing their role in the revolution and the fact that the dirge itself was actually still receiving weapons and support from the U.S. at this point, and would continue to until 1977. CELU members had turned the once docile organization into a highly radical one that was openly critical of the U.S.'s anti-labor and anti-socialist actions across the Third World. Marcos Hagos, its leader, was a member of EPLO as well. But the newly radicalized leadership of CELU and its past radical actions did nothing to end the dirge's ire for them. In September of 1975, the dirge held a celebration in honor of the first anniversary of the revolution. During the parade, EPRP supporters chanted and held signs with anti-dirge slogans, and chanted things such as fascist, fascist, down with you, down with petty bourgeois socialism, socialism is scientific, and popular provisional government now. CELU was a large part of organizing the disruption of the event, and the dirge responded accordingly. After continued strikes from CELU, the dirge retaliated with raids and mass arrests of strikers, including EPRP chairman Marcos Hagos. A state of emergency was declared in Addis Ababa, and the dirge arrested every labor leader it could find. Among the arrested were CELU head and EPRP member Marcos Hagos. EPRP CC member Samuel Alemayehu was also caught in the dragnet, though the dirge apparently did not realize his true affiliation. Marcos was tortured by Colonel Daniel Asphal, the chief of security services, and a key ally of the dirge's Major Mengitsu. During one interrogation session, Marcos was bleeding so profusely that the colonel ordered him to sit on the floor so as not to dirty the chair. The interrogation consisted of the repeated question, are you a member of the EPRP? Later on, the bloodied Marcos was paraded in front of the other arrested workers, while Colonel Daniel taunted all by stating, look at your chairman. Is he the one who would be king? While Marcos and many of the others were eventually released, it was a bad moment for both the independent labor movement and for EPRP. CELU was banned. That December, the dirge created the All-Ethiopian Trade Union. EPRP responded by creating an underground workers' union called ELAMA, and using it to call for protests and strikes, although their attempts at general strikes were short and ineffective. The meeting to establish ELAMA was held in the home of Daro Nagash, a feminist leader in the EPLO, mother of eight, and a former union president. Their membership grew, while AETU continued to be the only mainstream legal form of labor organizing, and was staffed with members of Maison. In 1975, the dirge began reorganizing itself to prepare for the creation of an actual political party. In 1976, they formed a provisional office for mass organizational affairs. This sector of the government was made up of Maison and Proletarian League members, who had already been informally advising the dirge under the Politburo. Several veterans of the student movement were elevated to official positions within the state, both through POMOA and through cabinet position replacements. Sine Liki and Khalifida's bids for political influence had, at least for now, been successful. While POMOA formed and began expressing its program for the Ethiopian Revolution, the EPRP continued to expand under tenuous legal circumstances. While the conflicts between the EPRP and the state hadn't become all-out war yet, it was potentially on the horizon. Apparent attempts were made by EPRP to work with POMOA if certain conditions were met, scaling down the war in Eritrea, releasing political prisoners, and establishing a democratic socialist government. 
but all these talks never happened. All the while, EPRP continued to build its youth wing and spread its propaganda. The dirge and EPRP at this point both had mass sway on Ethiopia's political scene, albeit from two completely different angles. The dirge began escalating its repression of EPRP in 1976. By that July, the dirge had already killed members of EPRP in acts of repression, and that same month murdered protesters at Arat Kilo. But it was the amendment to penal law that went into effect that month that formally enshrined the violence in the legal code. The sentencing for distributing what the dirge deemed subversive literature was increased and the death penalty was established as a punishment for anyone associating with anti-people and anti-revolutionary organizations within or outside the country. The EPRP responded to the ongoing violence and the coming repression by establishing an urban armed wing of the EPRA. The UAW was tasked with committing acts like bank robberies, training militants, and acquiring arms. The increasing bad blood between the dirge and the EPRP finally came to a formal head on September 11, 1976, when the dirge officially declared war on the EPRP. They were decried in public papers and were ordered to be literally killed on sight. The military government officially broadcast a statement designating the EPRP by name as public enemy number one. The statement piled on the EPRP accusations from the outrageous to the ridiculous. The fall in agricultural production, the rotting of crops, peasant rebellions, increase in commodity prices, lack of spare parts, machinery breakdowns in factories, the worsening of the living standard of workers, strikes by workers, students, and teachers, demonstrations, alleged refusal by European dock workers to load relief supplies destined for Ethiopia, the spread of prostitution, and a host of other problems were presented as the works of the EPRP. Meson and proletarian league members used their position within POMOA to aid in the hunt of EPRP members and created lists of names for the dirge to go after. Protests in response were met with mass arrests and essentially every activist arrested in the last two years was up for potential execution. EPRP had its members who were targeted for execution in leaked documents go into hiding and the UAWs immediately began to respond. On September 23rd, Mengitsu's car is attacked by EPRP members. He barely manages to escape. The attack does little to help the situation, as the two warring parties turn Addis Ababa and other cities into battlefields. The dirge continued arresting demonstrators en masse and occasionally executing a number of those arrested, with the numbers of arrested reaching over 600 by October 3rd, barely half a month after the war was declared. Meanwhile, POMOA organized anti-EPRP rallies to drum up popular support for the War of Annihilation taking place. Assassinations continued in October, when EPRP members successfully killed Fekre Muri, a CC member of Meason, university teacher and member of POMOA. The killers were soon after caught and were killed themselves by the dirge. Both sides of the split accused the other of starting the violence, although Ian Scott Horst insists that the violence was started by the dirge, and EPRP's assassination campaign was in response to them. Either way, violence beget violence, and the dirge began arming the Kebbles, urban dweller associations, and giving them policing powers. The Kebbles were nominally democratic, but were subjected to sham elections and purges, and the policing powers they wielded were used in a way that policing powers were always used. In Addis Ababa, there were 294 Kebbles, divided into 25 groups, and all headed by a mayor elected by a central committee. Alemu Abibi served in this position at the time, and was a central figure in the coming repression. Local jails were set up and staffed by armed members of the Kebbles, named Abiot Tebeka or Revolutionary Guards. The Abiot Tebeka had extensive powers, including the ability to perform no-knock raids on essentially anyone, jailing or detaining people on a whim, and committing violence without consequence. There are allegations that some used the unrestricted policing powers to commit acts of sexual violence, either by coercion or outright force, both under the pretense of detainment or arrest. We, the members of the oppressed masses in schools, factories, and kebbles, know every one of the anarchists and their stooges in our respective kebbles very well. If we raise our hands together determined to destroy them once and for all, it won't even take us a month. And we have to make this decision fast. The masses have to learn to be as brutal as the anarchists. The bastardly force must be crushed by whatever available weapon. The masses must unite to organize itself, to use its hammer, knife, etc., and exercise brutality on anarchists on a scale more than they are prepared to outstay. Anarchists who misunderstand the craving for peace of the masses and of their tender hearts as a sign for fear and naivety should no longer be permitted to live among us. As the violence began to build, both parties experienced a moment where they blinked. The dirge, for one, was not very unified. There was a coalition of dirge officers, Alamayehu Khaila, and Captain Mojiz Michael, who were wary of the fighting, 
and were more willing to make concessions with the EPRP in Eritrea to wind down the fighting that was draining the Dirge's resources and negatively impacting their ability to govern. At the end of 1976, these officers attempted to reorganize the government in order to maneuver Mengetsu, one of the more pro-war members of the Dirge, away from the levers of power. Alama Yehu Khaila was a member of the Addis Ababa police, and he found himself dissatisfied with the violence and ineffective rule of the Dirge. While Captain Mojis was allegedly a member of the EPRP, and at the very least his brother was, and he was in favor of finding a way to end the fighting and unite the Ethiopian left. Mengetsu, however, had his own faction, Abyot Sided, or just Sided, which means Revolutionary Flame. This faction was made up of his own loyal soldiers, who had been sent abroad to be trained in Russia, and members of Meison in the Proletarian League. His own faction urged him to act swiftly, and plans were leaked to the public of a coup, but when confronted, Mengetsu swore to Deferi Binti that they were lies. To sum up, within the dirge there were two factions, Mengetsu Sided or Revolutionary Flame Group, in favor of crushing the EPRP and winning the war in Eritrea, as well as cementing state power through terroristic violence, populism, and repression, and the group led by Mojis, Alamayehu, and Teferi, who were in favor of de-escalation of the internal conflict within Ethiopia and liberalization in the anti-repression sense of the political climate in order to reconcile some of the conflict. On January 29, 1977, Teferi Benti gave a speech where he called for unity and an end to the fighting among the Ethiopian left. While he still railed against some of the regime's enemies in the EPLF, ELF, and EDU, as well as others, he didn't name EPRP. This was seemingly a call for reconciliation. Progressive, anti-feudal, anti-imperialist, and anti-bureaucratic capitalist, and all other democratic forces, bear historic responsibility of closing ranks and forming a common front by sinking their minor differences in the spirit of the program of national democratic revolution in full awareness of the menace hovering over the country. There is no greater clarion call than that the motherland can make on them. We have no reason to believe that there is any progressive group or individual who will not respond to this call, nor can they be. It is imperative that all progressive forces concerned with the welfare and interests of the masses should at this critical point when enemies are poised on numerous fronts, close ranks, coordinate their efforts, and set an example in spearheading any undertaking demanding sacrifices. To Mengetsu, this was an open challenge, a threat, and one that would be dealt with accordingly. On February 3rd, Security Chief Daniel Asphal was ordered to lock down the palace, no one in or out. Teferi Benti's men were executed, and Mengitsu presented the dirge with evidence that Benti was planning on joining the EPRP along with several other men loyal to him. Allegedly, the documents included in the evidence exposed intentions to legalize the EPRP's political actions in order to help reconcile the conflict. Mojis, Teferi Benti, and Alamayehu were all executed on the spot. One of the dirge's lead investigators, a cop whose job was to hunt down opposition, snapped. Johannes Mitki attempted to leave the palace as the killings took place, but was stopped by a security guard who told him that Daniel Asphal had ordered the place locked down. Johannes had the security guard accompany him to Asphal's office, where he promptly shot the security guard and then shot Daniel Asphal himself. He then left the room looking to kill more members of the dirge's leadership and ran into none other than Sine Liki on the stairs. Sine was shot dead on the spot. When Mengetsu got word of what was happening, he sent his men to clear Johannes out of the office room where he barricaded himself, but they couldn't. Instead, and I swear I'm not joking, they drove a tank through the wall and collapsed the building on top of him. With the coup complete, Mengetsu had no enemies whatsoever within the Ethiopian government. The triumvirate that ruled Ethiopia alongside him was no more. There was only Mengetsu Haile Miriam and his revolution. The PMAC claimed that the upset at the palace was actually a failed coup against Mengetsu, and in a speech a week later, he says this, Henceforth we will tackle enemies that come face to face with us, and we will not be stabbed from behind by internal foes. Comrades and leaders of the broad masses will not be mowed down by anarchists in the bushes. Terror and anarchy will vanish from the camp of the broad masses, and reign in that of the reactionaries. We will duly reciprocate the campaign of terror being spread by reactionaries and avenge the blood of our comrades double and triple fold. Implying that reactionaries inside the PMAC had been holding them back, he makes for repeated calls not only for retribution, but for democratic rights. Revolutionary motherland or death. May EPRP, EDU, and ELF be obliterated. Democratic rights to the oppressed immediately, arms to the broad masses. Then the terror began.
had every right to have any bilateral relation with any country, with Cuba, with Soviet. Mengetsu declares the beginning of the Red Terror a bit after the coup, but historians seem to cite the beginning as 1976 regardless, as that is when the violence begins to pick up. Either way, he positions the Red Terror as an offensive against reactionary white terror of the EPRP, giving EPR's actions that name was a deliberate reference to the Soviet Union's battle against the White Army during the Bolshevik Revolution. I've brushed past much of the ideological sparring and sloganeering that all wings of the left do at this point because there's a lot of writing to include. All factions of the left in Ethiopia were often prone to a lot of sloganeering, and especially in the case of the dirge, manipulation of leftist and Marxist sounding language for one's own political maneuvering or justification of repressive actions. Mengetsu's earlier speech is a prime example of that. A call for democracy for the people of Ethiopia immediately, yet no action from the man who has the power to actually provide it. I digress. Just before this point, in 1976, EPRP faces internal strife over the urban warfare campaigns, which, which all are not aligned on, especially as the death toll rises. Gedichumaru and Verhana Mescaleta are expelled from the party central council after a dispute between them and the rest of the central council over the assassination attempt on Mengitsu turns into them being kicked off for taking the dispute outside leadership bodies. This splinters the party even more as new leadership wants to continue focusing on urban armed struggle, which Gedichu decries as terrorism, preferring to strengthen the rural armed struggle which will take longer but is the safer route, as the urban armed struggle has cost the party heavy losses. The EPRP seems almost obsessed with recreating the revolutionary moment from 1974. They wanted an insurrection that would lead to a coup and an easy step into power, something both ahistorical to the revolutions they fetishized and impossible for them. They seemed to not realize exactly why 1974 had happened, and why they couldn't recreate it. The urban armed struggle at this point had taken central priority to the party, even if their leadership wouldn't admit it, and Gedichu isn't wrong to call it terrorism. Most of the EPRP's targets are civilian members of POMOA, and Kebel leaders. The fighting is honestly quite nasty on both sides. In particular, there's a massive negative reaction to their assassination of Shiwalul Mengitsu, a feminist writer and Kebel leader. I think ultimately much of the blame falls on the dirge and Maison for raising the stakes of political struggle to murder by banning political parties and ruling through repression, and for using state power to exact retribution on political rivals from the Ethiopian student movement. The fact is that the dirge murdered anyone internal to the party who wanted to de-escalate the conflict, and they pushed EPRP to the point of armed violence. But either way, the EPRP had blood on its hands too and a difficult, taxing struggle in the cities that its leadership was dead set on fighting tooth and nail, even as destruction loomed heavy on their heads. An edition of Voice of the Broad Masses reads this, We are ready to unleash red terror on the EPRP fascists. Their blood will serve as the water with which we will put out the fire of counter-revolution. The repression amped up, and the EPRP began bleeding key membership, there was a wave of arrests and executions in Addis Ababa in late February that saw 44 executed, some as young as 17. A month later, Nega Ayeli, William Hastings Morgan, Johannes Brahane, and Melaku Marcos were all killed while attempting to flee the city of Addis Ababa by a mob of dirge supporters from the Abiyot Tebeka. On March 22nd, the dirge began the Assessa, a purge campaign that lasted three days, where the Abiyot Tebeka and the police went through neighborhoods systematically hunting and killing EPRP members and other counter-revolutionaries. Marcos Hagos is killed in a gunfight after being found days later. Tisfaya Debisi kills himself to avoid being caught and tortured. The struggle devolves into street combat. Mayasan and EPR members shoot at each other in a panic from cafe windows, street corners, and moving cars. Silence is broken by random gunfire from assassins, cops, or both. Nervous civilians are gunned down by trigger-happy cops. The factionalism among the left resembles gang warfare. As the urban armed conflict becomes more unbearable, many EPRP members begin fleeing the cities for EPRP bases in rural areas to the north, primarily in Asimba. Thus, finding myself suddenly homeless and unemployed the morning after the raid, I started to live the life of a fugitive. Everything happened so fast. In the space of a few hours, my life had changed forever. I could not return home. My family members could not return home. I did not realize it then, but this new way of life would engulf me for an undetermined period of time. 
The city of Addis Ababa became a prison, engulfed in a perpetual state of search, seizure, and senseless murders. The routine in itself frightened and horrified me. I had to leave the city. Daro Nagash, one of EPRP's few female leading members, a labor organizer and former president of the Berhanena Printing Press Union, and a mother of eight children, is also killed, along with eight other people. They were reported by their co-workers at the printing press. Dara Nagash was eight months pregnant. The details of her incarceration and her murder are too graphic to include here, but they are so horrendous that even members of the dirge gave pause and reconsidered their allegiances. Mengetsu had the person responsible for her torture executed, but it was already well known that his orders came directly from Mengetsu himself anyway. It was done to silence public dissent, but it didn't signal a slowdown on the violence. Meanwhile, Gedechu and Brahane Meskel were ordered arrested by the EPRP party security. Brahane escaped, but Gedechu didn't. He would later die trying to escape a police raid on the EPRP safe house where he was detained. Allegedly, EPRP members shot him, but it's not entirely sure who did. The Red Terror continued. The Kebbles became prisons as the second Decessa took place in late April and early May. 30,000 are held prisoner in Addis Ababa. Keith Lutifera, a member of EPRP's leadership, is caught and killed. The executed are put on display as a warning. People within the Kebel prisons are tortured and executed, as are occasionally their family members, wives, and children. Sexual violence is also allegedly prevalent. May Day weekend that year is a bloodbath, as EPRP members discover that their safe houses have been wiretapped, and plans for a May Day demonstration have been leaked. They aren't able to warn demonstrators in time, and the subsequent wave of repression kills anywhere between 500 to 600 people. The dirge denies any killings took place. The leader of the UAW, Germachu Lima, is killed himself in a raid when his safe house turns out to be a trap. The violence gets so bad that Ethiopian parents begin protesting the raids, using pots and pans and their voices to wake and warn their neighbors when the dirge comes for their kids. Mothers' associations provide mutual aid, safe houses, and care for young people in hiding from the dirge, and work together to hinder and block arrests and police raids long enough for people to escape. These mothers try in vain to march on dirge offices and demand an end to the terror, but they are killed themselves. As the terror continues, and the EPRP, now bolstered by hundreds of youths fleeing the cities, begins reconstituting the party in Asimba, Mengetsu continues his political machinations. The supply of weapons that the dirge had been receiving was beginning to dry up, as the country continued its political course, and Mengetsu wanted Soviet support, both for the weapons and the political clout it would give him. From the start of the revolution, the dirge was seeking support from foreign powers. At the time, this effort was spearheaded by the late Mojis, and attempts at gaining support from China and North Korea were inconclusive. The Soviet Union, however, began slowly building a relationship with the dirge. By this point, after the purges that secured Mengetsu's power in 77, the US began stopping its support of the dirge, and allegedly supporting and encouraging Sudan and Somalia to take action against Ethiopia, so an alliance with the Soviets was critical to keeping the dirge in power. The Sino-Soviet split weighed heavily on Ethiopia, as the dirge leaned Soviet, the EPRP leaned Maoist more than they already were. Ironic considering the fact that Haile Selassie had been courted by the Chinese government back when he ruled. The EPRP responded to the newly formed alliance by calling the Soviets social imperious, and even Maison was wary of the new connections. On May 6th, while on trip to Moscow, Mengitsu met Brezhnev and signed a formal treaty with the Soviet Union and Soviet influence over the economy and governance of Ethiopia grew. Capital export in the form of joint enterprises by the Soviet Union and its puppets is also on the rise. The expansion of the Czechoslovak-run meat canning plant in Ethiopia, the setting up of East German-run commercial farms in Walega, the recent conclusion of an agreement by the latter to expand the Assab harbor, are only a few examples showing that the Soviet revisionists and their allies are making rapid inroads into Ethiopia's neo-colonial economy. In July of 1977, Somalia, with half-hearted backing by the U.S., went to war with Ethiopia for the Ogaden region, an area to the west of Ethiopia bordering Somalia, where there is a large Somali population and some semblances of a nationalist movement to join Somalia. The Soviet Union tried to broker a peace beforehand between the two supposedly socialist nations, but failed, and Somalia swiftly invaded and captured Jajiga. The Soviet Union dropped their allyship with Somalia, 
This pushes them into the half-heartedly supportive arms of the U.S., and both Somalia and Ethiopia get hyped up to become a battlefield of the Cold War, despite the fact that neither side of the conflict sees it as that important to their priority list. The reaction of the international left is disappointing to say the least. Cuba and the Soviet Union both unquestioningly support Mengetsu and his regime. Before the 1977 power grab, the Soviet Union had initially supported Teferi Benti over Mengetsu and suggested his removal from power was a good idea. But when he maneuvered his way to the top, they wasted no time allying with him and congratulating him on his rulership. Their relationship with Ethiopian leadership was one of pure political convenience, and Cuba followed along unquestioningly. Fidel Castro personally visited, Cuban officials praised the dirge, and Che Guevara personally oversaw the security of the eastern border. In 1978, 15,000 Cuban soldiers, as well as Soviet military advisors, came to Ethiopia to secure the eastern border and aid in the counteroffensive. Though they promised not to get involved in the fight between various left forces, their allyship with the dirge at a critical point means that they did still aid the dirge in continuing repression. With the Somali invasion pushed back, the presence of the Cuban army on the country's eastern border allowed the PMAC to launch a nearly successful counteroffensive against the advancing Eritrean rebels. While Cuban forces did not apparently join the fight against the Eritreans directly, the Soviet advisors freed up by the defeat of the Somali certainly did. The EPRP summed it up bitterly. With the withdrawal of the Somali troops, the Soviets and Cuban criminals have lost one of their cherished arguments to justify their intervention. Thus it has become clear to all that the social imperialists intervened not to be frontier guards, but to neocolonize Ethiopia and consequently to gain control of the whole region. The help from the Soviet Union in Cuba was exactly what the dirge needed to push back the progress made by the EPLF. The growing relations with the Soviet Union were not well received by Mayasan, and to be fair, the Soviets didn't like them much either. The Soviet Union made it clear to Mengetsu that they were distrustful of any leftist forces in Ethiopia that weren't them. On top of that, while not outright Maoist, Mayasan used Maoist language in their writings and were critical of the USSR. Unsurprisingly, the Soviets leaned on Mengetsu to get rid of them. His alliance with Mayasan was only ever one of necessity. Early in the revolution, Mengetsu needed their help in order to build up the governing structure of the dirge, carry out certain policies, and give his regime the socialist language and credentials it needed to hold any sort of stable political power whatsoever in Ethiopia. With the Soviet Union's backing, they were irrelevant. POMOA was restructured, and a month later, in August of 1977, Mayasan members began going underground, seeing what was coming next. Haile Fida fled into the countryside. Mayasan accused the dirge of abandoning the National Democratic Revolution program. They decried the repression of the dirge, repression they had carried out alongside them. As well as expressing solidarity with the Eritrean struggle, they had a month before expressed animosity toward. Unfortunately for Mayasan, they had basically no real experience running an underground party during wartime. They had spent the last four years building the dirge's political structures, now those exact structures were the instruments of their demise, as Mayasan members were swiftly rounded up, hunted down, and killed. Inexperienced, panicked party members led police to safe houses inadvertently and got key leaders killed. They were trying to stage a coup and usurp power from the PMG. So they ran for their lives without proper preparation. They went to nearby villages where they were chased and caught. I was one of those who hunted them. I really enjoyed it. The ones whom we dug out from the villages were about 20. We shot and hanged 12 of them over there. If I find anyone that is a Mayasan supporter or member, I will eat his flesh. And then with his mouth on his hand, as if he was sucking liquid off his hand, he said, and I would drink his blood. Haile Fida and other key Mayasan members were swiftly caught and imprisoned. By 1978, 20,000 members of Mayasan's affiliated mass organizations joined them. Some Mayasan leaders committed In a moment of painful irony, Burhana Mescaloreta and Haile Fida would both be captured and imprisoned around the same time, both in Addis Ababa. Both would be executed by the dirge, strangled to death sometime in July of 1979. Hiwa Tefera was captured and imprisoned in 1978, and she spent eight years being tortured by the dirge as a political prisoner. In 2012, she wrote Tower in the Sky, an account of her experience in the revolution. She lives in Addis Ababa to this day. Zero Kishan flees in 1979 and dies in exile in the Netherlands in 2002. In mid-1978, the Red Terror came to a slow end. Maison had been functionally destroyed, and EPRP was on its last legs. The Proletarian League was soon to be headed for the Dirge's meat grinder following Maison, and a hundred of their members would also be purged. 
the EPRP's urban activities basically ceased, and all of the remaining party leadership was in the countryside. Political confusion, factional infighting, and witch hunts within the party tore them apart from the inside. While the party licked its wounds in Asimba, the TPLF saw an opportunity. Formed in 1975, the TPLF was a perfect foil. They were pro-national liberation and nationalist, rather than multinational like EPRP, Marxist-Leninist, and Hojists. During the time of the national question split, various national organizations for the different ethnic groups in Ethiopia sprang up, alongside the multinational Mayasan and EPRP. Another of these being the Aroma Liberation Front, founded in 1976. The TPLF had its origins in the Tigray University Students Association, which was established in 1971. In the early years, members of TUSA partook of both mainstream student union activities, as well as those strictly pertaining to their ethno-nationalist association. It was as if, to borrow from the academic curricular lexicon, they were majoring in one and minoring in the other. Which one was one's major and which one's minor varied from one student to another. Some, like Melis Tekli and Burhan Uyasu, were known more for the former than the latter. Melis was one of three activists who were executed by the Dirge in 1974 on trumped-up charges of bombing public buildings in the capital. His name has survived through one of his admirers, the subsequent EPRDF member, Melis Nilegesi Zenawi, who adopted his hero's name as his nom de guerre. Burhane eventually ended up joining the EPRP. Others, probably the majority, clearly put the premium on the ethno-nationalist agenda. TUSA members engaged in sensitizing both Tigrayan professionals and businessmen, and students in Tigray, about what they considered to be the particularly deplorable conditions of their region. Gradually, a more ideologically conscious caucus within TUSA, calling itself APTN, emerged. They were more commonly known as the Tigray National Organization, or TNO, and were to be the springboard for the more enduring Tigray People's Liberation Front. TPLF launched armed struggle against the Dirge regime in February of 1975 from the forlorn village of Dedebit, located in Shire province, northwestern Tigray. That armed struggle eventually culminated in 1991, in its seizure of state power, something that had eluded the acrimonious multi-ethnic left. The TPLF had no interest in allying with the EPRP, and knowing that it had no allies, as its relations with the itself struggling EPLF were non-existent, and its conflict with the dirge soundly lost. The TPLF decided to attack, and in late 1978, the EPRA was forced out of Isimba by the TPLF after being badly defeated. They survived and continued to exist, but their relevance in Ethiopian politics basically ended here. In 1979, the dirge, now having consolidated power, began a commission to create a workers' party. In 1984, they announced the creation of the Workers' Party of Ethiopia, and Mingitsu Haile Miriam was named General Secretary, and in 87, President of what is at that point known as the People's Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. He moves into the Emperor's Palace, drives the Emperor's cars, and rules over Ethiopia as the Emperor did. In 1983, a famine strikes, partially due to ongoing war against the TPLF. 1.2 million die, as Mengitsu restricts shipments of food to starve out the TPLF and its allies. By the end of the Red Terror, 250,000 were dead, before Mengitsu lay a mountain of corpses. The war continues, however. On May 28, 1991, the EPRDF, a coalition of ethno-nationalist forces, takes Addis Ababa, crushing the dirge as people tear down statues and celebrate in the street. The revolution finally ends. Mengitsu is already in Zimbabwe by the time they arrive. He lives there now, to this day. In May 1991, EPRDF forces finally 
after several gritty decades of war and repression, overthrew the dirge and set about creating a provisional government overseen by EPRDF chairman Melissa Zanawe, a Tigrayan party member. One of the primary things the EPRDF did was organize Ethiopia into a number of ethnic federations, each with the right to secede from Ethiopia if they wanted, which Eritrea did almost immediately in 1993. The EPRDF was not Marxist-Leninist. They had eschewed that label in favor of revolutionary democracy. So while they still considered themselves Marxist and had Marxist-Leninist elements, the party was open to other democratic political frameworks. This doesn't mean there was no repression. The EPRDF ruled with slightly less intensity than the dirge, but with some similar repressive steps, suppressing anti-EPRDF forces in the years following their takeover and quashing dissent in the press. This strain caused the OLF to leave the EPRDF in 1994, and there were waves of repression against their membership in the following years. Aside from brief spats with and within the TPLF in the early 2000s, however, there was relative stability in terms of who held power for almost 30 years, despite the slow economic growth and severe famine that hit in 1994, as well as ongoing waves of repression. By 1995, the EPRDF's Ethiopian Democratic Republic had its first constitution and was having its first elections, which they easily won. Opposition parties were barely allowed to run, and some people had boycotted participation in protest of the EPRDF's repression. The former Minister of Information in the Transitional Government, Nagasa Ogidada, became president alongside Melissa Zinawi, a veteran of the student movement, as prime minister. In the late 90s, there were border skirmishes near the town of Badme with Eritrea, which were mediated into tense peace by the UN which sent soldiers to Ethiopia to secure a buffer zone while peace talks continued. In 2002, a tense agreement was reached, and UN soldiers remained until 2008. Badme was awarded to Eritrea, and though Ethiopia wasn't happy, no further changes took place. 2005 elections were rocked by accusations of voter fraud, intimidations, and riots, as opposition parties swept the polls. Results were delayed for eight weeks as protesters clashed with police. Dozens died, and hundreds more were injured. By the end of it, over 3,000 people were arrested. It wasn't until May 2006 when a deal was reached between opposition parties and the EPRDF, and governance could continue. Later that same year, Mengistu was tried in absentia and given a death sentence for the crime of genocide in 2008, although that sentence has not been carried out and he is still alive. As time went on, the EPRDF continued to rule in Ethiopia quickly developing and with a rising economy. Despite this, political turmoil continued as the EPRDF kept a tight fist on power and was often criticized for its authoritarian practices and blatant manipulation of the democratic process. There were ongoing waves of protests and continued actions from groups like the OLF and other radical organizations. Things began to look up as the Prime Minister Haile Mariam Dessalin stepped down, hoping that the move would help trigger reforms. Abiy Ahmed was elected later that year and was the first Oromo to be elected prime minister in Ethiopian history. Under him, successful peace with Eritrea was brokered, groups like the OLF had their terrorist status rescinded, the cabinet was reorganized and half of its new appointees were women, and Abi promised to improve economic and democratic conditions within Ethiopia. Political prisoners were pardoned and released, and massive change seemed to be on the way. Abi Ahmed even won a Nobel Peace Prize for his achievements. This was all to slowly degrade, though, as Abiy's reformation of the EPRDF into a new political party called the Prosperity Party angered the TPLF, who resented no longer being part of a political arrangement that favored them, as well as the pace of the reforms that had come. In 2020, elections were postponed due to COVID, and the TPLF leapt into action, claiming that the postponement was a power grab and attacked an Ethiopian military base, which prompted response from the Ethiopian military. Though Abiy claimed they didn't at first, Eritrean troops were involved on the side of Ethiopia. Both the TPLF and the Ethiopian state were accused of committing acts of ethnic cleansing, and famine plagued the region of Tigray as a communications blackout hampered the spread of information and Abiy Ahmed's government withheld supplies and relief from reaching Tigray. In November of last year, peace agreements were finally reached, and as of now, the war has ended and a tenuous path to peace is being forged. The future remains to be seen. The failure of the student movement lies in a multitude of factors, not to dismiss their successes. At their height, student activists led thousands against two fascistic regimes, pushed for women's rights, democratic rights, and for the impoverished, even in the face of police murders, assassinations, school closures, expulsions, intimidation, beatings, and torture. 
they increased the literacy rate, radicalized high school students and parents, and fought to make their home a better place. The internal politics, maneuvering, and compulsions toward power that their leaders fed into is ultimately what got them killed. Had the students' leaders abandoned pride and status and been more willing to work together through petty disputes and been more open to de-escalation later on in the revolutionary process, things might have changed. EPRP's lukewarm and sometimes inconsistent stance on the national question led to mutual distrust between them and the National Liberation Fronts that prevented real allyship while the NLFs didn't have the same issue as much among each other, and ultimately created a multinational state in line with what the EPRP was wanting anyway. Maison's commitment to the dirt, a military junta that continued the blatantly colonial war in Eritrea, made anything they said about the national question really irrelevant on every level. Any sections of the dirt that were truly socialist resided in Maison or Proletarian League, two still quite questionable organizations, both of whom were annihilated by the dirt once Mengitsu no longer saw use for them. The dirge both destroyed leftist enemies in the EPRP for demanding democracy, and then killed the leftists who collaborated with them to build their infrastructure as a party. There's something tragically ironic about their downfall. Sine Liki, ousted from political relevance, is so desperate for it that he colludes with fascists, and ultimately is killed for being at the wrong place at the wrong time, destroying the relevance he thought he had achieved and leaving him just another body for the dirge to clean up. His killing does nothing to give them pause. He never truly achieves the political relevance he wanted, and even though Haile Fiedin needs him to gain power, once he has it, his relevance outpaces Leakey's, and the two of them often vie for power within Pomoa. Haile Fida sidelined Leakey almost personally, yet he's forced to crawl back to him for political power, only for him to build the political structure that would kill him, and end up strangled to death on the same day, in the same jail as his greatest rival. Berhanen Meskel was a fiery radical and was eager to begin fighting Haile Selassie and the Dirge, but the speed of his organization's radicalization outpaces even him, and he ends up arrested and killed by the Dirge alongside his main rival. His friend and ally, Gedichumaru, one of the EPRP's founding members, ends up imprisoned by their own party, and when the Dirge finds the safe house where he's held, they raid it, and he is shot dead allegedly by one of his own party members as he tries to escape in the chaos. The fact that no one even knows for sure which side the police or EPRP shot him highlights the randomness and pervasiveness of the violence that EPRP, despite their intentions, helped to create. Mengitsu slaughtered his own people and did whatever it took to keep himself in power. Whether he merely wanted to rule Ethiopia or genuinely wanted to make it better, he couldn't help but participate in and instigate its destruction. And now, regardless of his intentions, his sins mean he can never return to the home he once ruled. It's either the tale of a road to hell paved with good intentions, or the rightful banishment of a butcher. Either way, there is blood on his hands. Ultimately, all of these various party structures had similar or identical politics and flaws. The dirge bears most of the responsibility by virtue of being the state, and having the most capacity to engage in, escalate, or de-escalate violence and repression if they chose. But all of the factions bear accountability for the violence that took place. The war ate away at the progressive actions and reforms of the dirge as well as the EPRP, and slowly became the obsession of both parties. It drained resources and membership. Much of Ethiopia's first educated generations were forced to flee or were killed. Brain drain still affects Ethiopia to this day. The Ethiopian Revolution is a tragic tale, one fraught with political turmoil, betrayal, paranoia, and monstrosity. But among that history is a shining light. The stories of Martha Mibratu, Daro Nagash, Walalin Mekonin, Tilahun Jaza, Marcos Hagos, and thousands more martyrs give us lessons and inspiration. Hundreds of thousands of Ethiopian youth and people gave their lives to fight for a better life and a better nation. Sacrificed by party leaders and militaristic juntas, it was the rank and file, the militant feminists, unionists, and peasants together with the students that made anything radical and worthwhile happen. While party structures played chess with their lives, students taught their communities, fought for them, and cared for them. Mothers and fathers organized to protect their radical children from government bullets, and their footprint is still felt in the protests for democracy and human rights that have been seen in recent years, and in every step forward Ethiopians take now. In the words of Baruzoidi, they had no hidden agenda. They were driven by what has driven youth everywhere and throughout the ages, the quest for social justice and equitable development.
Thank you for watching this video. Uh, I find myself feeling very emotional as I finish up this project. This was a very heavy story to tell, and I pray that I did it justice. To my Ethiopian and Eritrean comrades watching this video, I hope that you enjoyed it. And please forgive me for my pronunciation issues. I realized like halfway through editing this that I had pronounced Mingistu's name Mingitsu like a million times. I hope you all especially find that I've done this history its due. Thank you. Check out my Patreon to support this channel. Most of my videos are either not monetized because it wouldn't feel right for the topic to me, or they can't be because of arbitrary restrictions or copyright issues or whatever. So if you can support the artist, which is me, you can find previews to videos, poetry, movie reviews, and book reviews, short stories, and more on there. And if you look below, there are also other ways to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time, whenever that is.